Ed Norton's tonight. <laughs> um, so um, noting the hour and the presence of a quorum, I'd like to call the May 17, 2021 meeting of the Acting Select Board and the Acting Sewer Commissioners to order. Uh, note the uh, town of Acton in response to the COVID-19 virus pandemic currently following uh, the guidance from the Acton Board of Health, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and the CDC. Um, uh, the Acton Town Hall is now open to the public. This meeting will be streamed online on the Acton TV YouTube channel and audio will be broadcast live on radio WA. WAEM 94.9 FM. To participate remotely uh, from a computer, use the link to join the public meeting, uh, actinma.gov slash meeting slash BOF and telephone dial uh, 646-876-9923 and enter webinar 503-918-785. Telephone users may dial star nine to request to speak. Computer and app users may use the raise the hand feature uh, to request to speak. Um, John, uh, first item of business are sewer commissioners to discuss wastewater improvements and presentation of the uh, sewer rate recommendation. Thank you. Uh, members of the select board, uh, acting as sewer commissioners this evening. Um, so the sewer commissioners haven't, haven't fully met in a little bit. Um, we were on track to do this work that we're presenting tonight, and then the pandemic got in the way. Um, but we were, we're back tonight, and we wanted to present to you a few things uh, that are happening in terms of uh, how we're looking to maintain and continue to maintain our, our infrastructure, and also uh, the work that we did to look at our rates and uh, ways to make sure that the rates that uh, the board and the sewer commissioners implement are sufficient to maintain operations going into the future. So uh, Corey York uh, runs the, the project for us. He's our director of public works, as you all know. Uh, Jack Troidel is our engineer, our lead engineer for Wooded and Kern. Toby Fetter is uh, another member of the team from Wooded and Kern who uh, helped with the rate analysis. So Corey, if you want to just uh, introduce Jack and, and uh, we'll, we'll do our presentation. Jack, I think you can share your screen if you, if you, have, uh, if you have it. Yeah, uh, so John basically said it all in a nutshell. So we, we've, been, <laughs> we've been working on this, and um, we just wanted to get before you to kind of show you where it was. We everything got kind of stalled, but um, it all it's all kind of coming together as far as um, just all the work we're doing and how it fits into the model. So uh, Jack and Toby helped us along with that rate study. So um, I'll hand it over to Jack, and he can take it from here. Hey. Are we good? You see the, the slideshow correctly? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you for the introduction. But again, I'm Jack Troidel with Woodard and Kern, um, the town sewer consultant. Uh, yeah, Toby Fetter will, um, he worked on the rate model and he'll be presenting um, towards the end of the, the presentation. Um, so we'll, we'll cover an overview of the wastewater system. Um, we'll talk about the, the main phase 2A project um, and, and the rehabilitation work that that includes. And, and we'll wrap up um, also with some of the, the rates. So, Jack, am I visible? You are, Toby. Okay, wonderful. I just don't see myself on my own screen. Yeah. Okay, so. In the agenda, as I just kind of said, we'll, we'll start with an overview of the wastewater system. Uh, we'll talk about some of the planning needs um, of current and projected projects. Then we'll talk about the sewer operations plan and, and the work that's ongoing. And then we'll um, conclude with some sewer rate discussion and, and what the rates look like. And then we'll open it up to some Q&A. On this slide, the area shaded in gray is the existing sewer service area. Um, you see three colored areas um, adjacent to that. Those were identified in the, the 2006 CWRMP as future expansion areas. Um, the green area, uh, Great Road, was originally planned to have its own satellite uh, wastewater treatment um, facility and discharge. Uh, we do think that a better solution for that, um, if it is considered, is that it would come into the district 
and it would make better use of the town's uh, current sewer assets. Uh, building building a new plant and an additional discharge um, can be very challenging. The existing system includes 11 sewer pump stations. Uh, the, the majority of these pump stations have buildings. Um, a few of them have on-site generators for backup power because they are critical assets. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant is a sequencing batch reactor. And don't worry, you don't need to know what that means, but we got a small graphic to the right that shows how the wastewater is processed through the plant. But in short, there's a bunch of concrete tanks and pumps and screening to remove uh, debris from the water, um, as well as UV disinfection um, all in the plant. And all of that equipment um, was built about 20 years ago. The, grout, the plant treats to a very high quality effluent, which then gets discharged into the ground um, with the five uh, rapid infiltration beds. And they're just open sand beds that the wastewater gets discharged on, onto and then it percolates into the ground. Uh, those have a, a mass DEP permitted limit of about 300,000 gallons a day, and that's on a maximum day basis. So that's, that's the most flow that we can send um, into the ribs at any given time. So as I said, these assets are all 20 years old and they require rehabilitation. Uh, we, want that, we want everything to operate reliably and efficiently. Um, and you can assume that when a pump's been in operation for 20 years, it's not operating um, as efficiently as it, as it used to and sometimes not as reliably. This graph should look familiar. Um, the blue jagged line is the average flow going to the wastewater plant. You see there's about 125, 130,000 gallons um, a day there. Um, we do look at the purple line when we start looking at the limits of the discharge. And there's about 70,000 gallons remaining uh, between what your current flows are and what your, your permitted limit is. So you are currently discharge um, limited. So if you wanted to add more flow beyond the 73,000 gallons, you got to raise the red line. So looking at future flows to the treatment facility, um, the question is, you know, how much need is there? Uh, South Acton, uh, the powder mill road area was identified as a, um, as, as a needs area. Um, and it is looking at um, being sewer as part of the, the powder mill apartments project. Um, so that is a, a potential area for new users. Uh, Powder Mill will bring on about 230 new users. So that is a significant amount of flow coming to the plant. Um, that's about 20% of your of the current flow. And there's infill and redevelopment within the district. Um, and that's, an, that's ongoing, um, both new connections for people who haven't tied in and redevelopment to more intensive uses. And that's that's happening every year. Um, and Great Road, um, that is a, a significant area and a lot of potential users. Um, as I said earlier, that would be in lieu of its own satellite facility up there. Um, it would, it can be treated more efficiently if it's connected into the existing plant, uh, more cost effective. This graphic has a lot on it, but I think it really paints um, Acton's wastewater picture. Um, we talked about the flows and, and the purple line as your max day flow. And then the bar graph in the middle of the chart uh, represents all the potential um, sewer connections. So Powder Mill Place um, is, is an ongoing project. The sewer district infill um, is in green. And then the Powder Mill Road connections um, that could tie in later are shown in purple. Um, as well as Great Road and then long-term planning need. Um, a lot of the long-term planning need is just general infill beyond near-term um, projects. On the left side of the graph, we have a, a few different red lines, um, but the existing um, treatment capacity is a little over 400,000 gallons um, per day. We can easily raise that line close to the 600. It might, I might have been a little aggressive on the 600,000, but we can raise that line to a number between 500 and 600,000 um, by adding some small equipment within the plant and, and an equalization tank 
um, which was um, it is currently being funded um, by Outer Mill Apartments. Um, and then when we look at the plant overall, it was built, it designed and built with an eye to the future. Uh, so there's about a million um, gallons per day of uh, capacity in the plant. So that's, you got plenty of capacity with the SBRs. It's just a matter of some equipment um, um, upgrades uh, if you wanted to access that capacity. Uh, looking at the discharge capacity, that's on the right side of this graph. So you've got 73,000 gallons remaining. Um, powder mill place will use quite a bit of that flow and then any remaining and any uh, near-term projects that get approved for connections will use out of that 70,000 gallons. Um, so approaching the 300,000 um, fairly quickly. Um, and, and we show here adding 300,000 gallons of discharge. That's going to be a function of the site that's identified and how much capacity, how much wastewater can be discharged um, into that site. So it's a, a, a very detailed hydrogeological um, study that will need to be performed once the site is selected. Um, there's a few different locations that we've been looking at, um, but we're, we're, the goal is to, to identify that um, this year. So, and effectively, for any of these users to tie in, you have to have both the discharge capacity and the treatment capacity. But as it stands, you have plenty of treatment capacity in the near term, but the discharge capacity is, is your, your near term limit. So on the sewer operations plan, uh, the phase one ongoing repairs, um, that was a lot of near term equipment that needed to get addressed quickly that was done out of the annual budget. Um, that's a matter of spending a, a few hundred thousand dollars every year um, for just things that are that are failing. Uh, we are seeing more and more equipment fail prematurely. So instead of replacing something that's about to fail, we're now starting to chase some of the equipment that has already failed. The phase 2A project um, is on this year's annual stop meeting. Uh, it's a $6.2 million project. Uh, that's the, the total project cost. Um, that includes rehabilitation of the facility, including the control system. In that, for instance, um, the controls are no longer supported by the manufacturer. Um, electronics like that become outdated fairly quickly, but they've been in there for a very long time um, and are, are still operating, but you know, starting to have some, some failures. Um, it also includes the um, limited upgrades to the equalization and aeration um, for, for capacity. Uh, on the funding side, it, we did, Acton was awarded a MassWorks grant and $900,000 comes off the, the cost of the project um, from MassWorks. And there's half a million dollars coming from the developer mitigation money. Um, that leaves 4.8 million um, of project costs um, to be paid for by the enterprise. $300,000 of that for the capacity related items um, will be paid for from stabilization funds. Uh, we do think there's opportunity for potential stimulus funding. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to look for those opportunities and hopefully more come out over the next few months. Um, the remainder, approximately $4.5 million will be paid over a 20 year loan using that state revolving fund. And that's a low interest loan. It's, it's going to be about 2% or so. And then the phase two B project, is, is the groundwater exp expansion. Um, we're currently looking for the site this year. Um, additional investigation would be next year and the earliest for construction of that would be 2023. And, and the timing of the phase 2B work would really depend on, on need and, and connections. And as far as those connections, Powder Mill Apartments is, is, is the biggest near term. 446 Mass Ave is, is connecting. Uh, there are other potential projects in Kelly's Corner and others, so certainly seem to be the need is there. Um, and then the phase three is the treatment capacity expansion. That was the left side of the graph. Um, it was adding a lot more equalization tanks and, and diffusers and other, other equipment um, to, to, to get more treatment out of the plant. <clears throat> Looking at it on a schedule, um, the CPE report was completed in 2019. 
Uh, the MassWorks grant was awarded at the end of 2020, so that, that was a big win um, for the project. Uh, the Phase 1 repairs are ongoing. Um, as I said, those are miscellaneous near-term replacements that need to happen. And then the orange are the design and construction of the Phase 2 upgrades, um, and that's rehabilitating a lot of uh, pumps, um, re replacing any piping issues, replacing valves. We're actually seeing some valves are failing. Um, so a, a lot of reliability upgrades in, in that rehab project. And the phase 2B, that, that's the timing of that isn't um, exactly clear, but we'll continue identifying additional uh, sites. And phase 3, the future um, capacity expansion, I think that's down the road quite a ways, but I just wanted that to be, be noted at some point you'll reach um, the capacity of the uh, existing building. So why why do you need to do the phase 2A rehab project now? Um, it was identified in the CPE. So Woodard and Curran went through the plant. We looked at the condition of equipment. We looked at the conditions of, of tanks, um, of the roof, of the windows, um, and, and all, the, all the equipment in the plant. Um, and it's 20 years old. It's been operating for, for um, I think 19 or 20 years. And when you look at some of these graphics on the right, <clears throat> this is some failed equipment. The pump at the bottom, you can see it's corroded, but at the bottom is you, there's actually a hole in the pump. And that's the major issue there. You're just not getting the efficiency out of that. And eventually it's gonna lead to failure. Um, the small photo on the left was a gate valve that actually failed. And it, and it took um, Mike Thompson, the operator, a few months to get somebody to come in, get a valve ordered, uh, and, and, and replace the slide gate. So that that it, that system wasn't operating correctly uh, for a series for many months. Um, and then the lower picture are just some of the couplings in the wet well, which is a very corrosive environment, and those are all leaking. And access to do those repairs is very difficult. So doing this as part of the overall project was absolutely the most efficient way um, to do the work. And also to look at the flow and, and the overall needs of these upgrades to make sure we do everything um, in as efficient and um, you know in the best manner that we can. Um, so we want to be proactive and not reactive as we see more equipment failing. Um, I know right now Mike has, has a valve that failed mostly open and lucky, luckily that, that works but that's a critical valve that he needs to get replaced. So we're trying to get ahead of those types of failures with this project. And obviously we wanna maintain the treatment performance and reliability. We don't wanna have any violations with the, with the discharge permit. So we wanna make sure everything operates well. And currently there's several funding sources. I, I talked about MassWorks, the developer mitigation funds and potential stimulus money. So certainly that's coming off the top and, and helping to lower the overall cost to the, the sewer enterprise. And ultimately, it is required by Mass DEP as a as part of the groundwater discharge permit. So, looking at the sewer rates, um, I'll let Toby um, cover some of the details of the model. Um, but first, I just want to talk about the graphic on the right. So that's showing the overall um, the way that this project is being paid for. Um, the MassWorks is, is is a is money off the top. Um, it certainly helps a lot. Um, adding the, the 230 users, um, those are new users that, that you currently don't have connected. That's going to help pay um, this loan over the next 20 years. And then there's additional money coming off the top, the, the $500,000 of mitigation money for the equalization tank and some other pump station upgrades, as well as the $300,000 of reserves. And that's landing at the two and a half percent increase um, to cover the remainder of the project. Oh, so oh. thanks, Jack. I'll uh, we'll take it away from here. <clears throat> I mean, the, the, I think the big takeaway from this graph that, that everyone should be aware of is the addition of new users who, who present a new revenue stream entirely um, you know, are, are a, a massive impact and uh, a, a very substantial benefit to the overall sewer utilities. Um, we will still need, you know, small increases, I, I would say, 
but um, the, the, the fact of the matter is, if you guys were unable to get new users without, um, or, or pardon me, if you were to finance the project without new users, this would be a problematic situation. That's, that's all. And, and Jack, I mean, you, you told me what you want me to, you know, talk about here. Yeah, you can, I, I can bump you to the next slide, Toby. But yeah, effectively in, in fiscal 20 and fiscal 21, um, the rates were steady. Um, but right. looking at the, the two and a half percent to, um, to, to catch up a little bit. Um, but again, it, it, it's, you know, that's more or less covering inflation of, of, of looking forward. In many ways, yeah. You're, you're, you're no doubt right. Go ahead and bump me up forward. So this is what we're looking at for the rates. We have the uh, the current rates, and we're proposing to increase the volumetric rates by 2.5% for each of the next three years. And um, the rates are presented. They're, they're a little bit lower down on the, uh, on the table there, but... Yeah. And well, this is what the uh, projected performance of the utility will be. We will burn some of our reserves with those rates. That was one thing that came up during the rate study was the question of do we have too much reserves? And what is the right amount of reserves? And, and so we targeted the rate recommendation to, if you look at the green line, to basically break even in fiscal 24 while still maintaining reserves balances that were uh, expected in the past. And as far as the, the timing of, of, of that, um, a powder mill coming online. I think we have that in 2023. Um, we, had, we did yep. update the model based on, on the current schedule. Um, yep. so that's all, powder mill. Yep. So that's all accounted for. Um, and then if there were any, any concerns as far as timing of there, there's still um, remaining reserves that could help cover that debt service. I think the debt service on the remaining loan is about $300,000. That would be could easily be covered out of out of reserves for a year or two as needed. I mean, you wouldn't want to draw it down much more, but but I think there's some flexibility in there if needed. Right. I think the big thing is just bringing on powder mill. I mean, it's such a big revenue source. It's critical to the long term. I would say financial success of the utility. That's all I'll say. And actually, I, I just want to go back. I know, Toby, you did say it, but yes, the 2.5% fixed for three years is, is the rate recommendation. Um, included. And that's the, the extent of our presentation. We'd have be, be happy to uh, take any questions, but the, the short version is, is the phase 2A rehab project um, see the, the plant on, on the right side of the, the aerial here um, is, is, is just a, a rehab project uh, primarily to keep everything operating well um, you know fix fix some issues on the roof fix some windows fix the heating system um, fix pumps and other equipment all the critical um, infrastructure at the plant um, if we look at the plant like your house um, you know, a lot of these, win, you know, windows and heating systems and appliances are, are 20 years old and, and they're not, you know, they're at, at risk of failing. And if they do fail, um, you know, in your house, you can manage that. You can go out to eat for dinner if you want. But in the plant, if that pump fails, the wastewater still comes to the plant and Mike needs to make sure that it keeps going through. Um, so he has to find a way to make that work. So it's it's important to make sure that all of our primary systems and or backup systems are, are fully reliable. So we're, you know, it's really a process of getting into the plant, upgrading the, uh, rehabbing the SBRs and pumps and, and the tanks. The tanks are actually all in great shape. Um, a lot of other miscellaneous repairs. So. 
Okay, are there questions or comments from board members, please? Sure. Sure. Uh, Jim. Um, so many questions. Uh, it's been a long time since we've had a sewer commissioner's meeting. Um, so if any of these questions, uh, Mr. Chair, you think are out of scope for this, maybe we can just make a note and, and talk right. about them at a future meeting. Um, so first, just an education question for me, the gallon per day permitted limit, uh, is that actually um, permitted on a daily basis or is that what the average we have to hit every week or every month or what does that limit actually mean? Yeah, that is the maximum amount of flow that can be discharged in a single day. Okay. So okay. It, it's the, in 24 hours on the calendar, that's your, that's your max day. So on the graph, I didn't highlight it, but there was one purple dot for each year that represented yes. the highest flow. That's what that purple line was drawn from. Got it. Um, and um, what you you made it you made a calculation about because you showed it on the chart about um, a, a developmental infill um, and I was wondering what how you whether you could send on the uh, calculations that you used for that that kind of that kind of information about. Um, you know, calculated uh, infill and future development is really important for a lot of things we do, including this uh, water study that the Water Resources Advisory Committee is just about to launch into. So I'd love to know what planning assumptions you used. And I assume they're relatively complicated, so feel free to just send them to me. But if they're, if they're simple, you could maybe explain them. Yeah, yeah, and, and it... it um Near term, we did look at some of the proposed expansion projects, um, but we we looked at infill potential within the district, and we did look at, um, you know, just say that there were, you know, say there's 100 properties in the district and 70 are connected. You know, we estimated the flow from the remaining 30, but we also looked at known potential projects, and then we tallied up. Yeah, we have it all in a table, so I can right. get that and send it along. That would be great. Thanks so much. So, Jim, I just wanted to point out that the infill here may be different than infill for other things because yeah. there may be properties that have paid their betterment but just never hooked up. Mm -hmm. And so there's zero flow from them now. Mm -hmm. Right. But um, And so the infill is just the connection next time they're, you know, instead of replacing a septic system. Got it. Thank you. Um, let's see. Next one. Um, is there is there any current modeling or assumptions about how much of the discharge water ends up in the river and how much ends up in the groundwater in such a way that it can get over to our uh, drinking water supply pumps? So the 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 discharge was modeled um, and back in two thousand and seven. So the initial discharge was. A uh, 250,000 gallons. <clears throat> it was modeled, I think, in 2007 um, when it was raised to the 299. Um, so that's the limit the state would give for this this site. Um, the area is um, in in the zone two of the wells, which which basically says if it doesn't rain for um, I forget, I think it's six months. If it doesn't rain for six months that this is the area that would ultimately go to the wells. But since it doesn't not rain for six months, it doesn't really go to the wells and it had to get closed down um, along um, towards the river. Okay, so substantially all the all the discharge after it's filtered, doing your filtration and then the natural filtration through the soils ends up in, in, in the river. I think it does. I, 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 don't know the path it takes. I think it might actually go on this figure. It might go more left. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. I don't think it flows directly to the river. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's going into the groundwater, and mm -hmm. here we all that groundwater is, is is going to the river. Um, yeah, and and the plant does remove, um, you know, a, a lot of pollutants and nitrogen, and and it does have a specific um, phosphorus removal system as well. Yeah. Yeah. No phosphorus is the big issue with the river. Um, thanks. Um, so you, you talked about the pros and cons of, uh, of how to deal with the needs on Great Road. I had a couple thoughts about that and some questions. Um, one was, I noticed that in the, in the, in the, the uh, 
See, how do we pronounce CWRMP, the Cormorant? Um, the, the Comprehensive Water Resources Management Plan uh, does describe these needs areas, but in some cases it says um, needs could be addressed by having a, uh, a management district. Um, not necessarily a, a, even a, a, a shared septic system or a sewer connection. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Just because there's needs doesn't mean they have to be addressed by sewers. Um, but in terms of Great Road, um, you mentioned that your calculations were looking that it would be uh, more financially viable to send those that, that effluent down to our main treatment plant. But the question I had about that was, wouldn't that mean that wherever you sent that pipe would need to become part of the sewer district um, between Great Road and wherever it connects up with our existing sewer lines? Correct, yes. I think I think whichever road, typically we would run a line like that down, down the road. Um, there might be some cross-country routes as well. Um, but... Typically, yeah, those those properties abutting it have will get service as well and active. Okay, so I guess this is then a comment from my fellow commissioners, which is, we haven't um, debriefed uh, the what we learned from the attempt to sewer West Acton, um, and we need to do that if we're going to be thinking of expanding the sewer district. I mean, right now we have this financial structure where new members, uh, new households. New, new, new lots that are in a new expansion sewer district pay for the costs of that expansion, uh, which made, in the case of West Acton, the cost be so high that, um, you know, we had, we had a, a failed vote at town meeting just to have the sewers there. Um, so I think we need to address that uh, before we could entertain, um, you know, expanding the sewer district. Um, the other question I had on that line was, is the uh, expansion to serve the powder mill development, is that an expansion of the sewer district? That, that line would, would sewer the needs area, the South Acton needs area. Okay, so that's an expansion of, this, of, this, of the sewer district. Is that right? Can I answer that? Sure. Thanks. Yeah. So, Go ahead. so be, be, um, uh, Jim, because this is being paid for by the project, there is no betterment. So betterments are used to pay off the loans for uh, uh, better properties or sewers in this case, right? Since there, since th this is being paid for, um, uh, um, there is no betterment, and we can choose as sewer commissioners whether to allow uh, connections along that route or not. Right. Yes. And if they connect, then they would pay a privilege fee, you know. Right. Uh, so you know, so you know, suppose one of the car dealers wants to connect. If if we want to let them, we can. If we don't want to let them, we don't have to. Um, that that's that's up to us. But nobody gets bettered here. Got it. Oh, thank you. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, and can, can I? Can I just say sure. one other quick, quick sure. thing? Please to clarify one of Jim's questions. Tonight we're considering. Um, uh, just a re rehabilitation project, no expansion in what we're considering tonight. But I completely agree with that. We have to consider the financials of any expansion. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, it's just yeah, like like I said, it's just been a long time. I don't I don't know if I've ever even sat as a sewer commissioner in my in my year as a, on, on the board. So uh, I, I just have a lot of catching up to do. Um, let's see. That might be about it. Uh, Yeah, that's it. Thanks so much. Sure. Joan, you had your hand up? Yes. The alternative site for discharge that you're looking at, how far away can that be, and what would be the size of the parcel? Um, the, 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 the further it is, um, the more expensive it'll be to, to run a, a discharge horse main. Um, I, I think in a perfect world, um, when you look at the size of the ribs in this photo, um, of the discharge um, rapid infiltration beds, um, we'd love to have that same size again. Um, but I think it's a matter of what space is available. Um, potentially, the other side of this site 
um, you know, is, is one that we're looking at, and you definitely wouldn't get that much um, there. Uh, I do think we, we started looking within about a mile or two away from the plant, but depending on availability of land, you, you, you could go further. And what's the size? Is it one acre, four acres? I, sh I should have that, but I don't have that number in front of me as far as how many acres it is. The current sewer parcel appears to be about, the whole thing appears to be about 30 acres to get you a sense of the comparative size of things. Yeah, which, and, and it includes a lot of land on the other side, so mm -hmm. um, it, it's a couple acres. I could pull it up on my phone. Uh, David? Yeah, so I, I had a chance to re review this, and um, I, I think this is really good. Uh, one really important point um, is that um, the DEP will be requiring us basically to make these um, uh, rehabilitation changes um, to keep everything up, up to scratch and so that we, we don't have failures because a failure at the wrong time. Um, uh, can, can mean violations of the, the discharge um, permit. Also, um, the uh, various funding sources, including the recent uh, MassWorks grant, has you know kind of aligned for us here. And so, um, you know, the, doing these things all at once means a uh, a minimal uh, increase in the uh, rate that. Uh, 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 people in the sewer district now will will pay so just uh, two and a half percent a year for th for three years so it's uh, um, I, I think you know the things have come together very nicely here I do have one question for Jack is 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 a roof actually a part of the project it's maintenance um, of the roof we're not replacing it. Um, it it's a metal roof but there's some areas where there's some corrosion so it's a matter of, of of repairing that and, and painting um, portions of it. Okay, thank you. Yep. That's all. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. Uh, Joan, did, were your questions answered? Yes. Uh, Dean, do you have any questions? Uh, no questions. I, I think I'm up to speed on it. Thank you. Okay. So, um, John, what would you like us to do at this point? Um, so, uh, thank you. So, basically, the the purpose of this meeting tonight was just to give you the background on the recommended rate structure. Uh, and we'll, we'll plan to come to the sewer commissioners before the end of the fiscal year uh, to ask you to formally adopt the rate structure. Uh, okay. And then the other portion of it was just because we accelerated the uh, timing for this rehabilitation project and it's appearing on the warrant in, in June as Article 5. We wanted to make sure that you had this foundation um, of information about the rationale for it, and then we'll continue to provide more detail to support the warrant article that um, is currently in draft form. So, 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 just one question: the the uh, I think it was it four point five million that will be borrowed under a state loan. Who uh, who services that debt? So. Um, if Jack, if you could actually not share the screen anymore and someone could help me bring Steve Barrett in. He's, he's in the meeting with Steve Barrett, um, Stephen Barrett, I think. As a Matt, uh, Matt Murphy, if you could help me with that. There he is. Thanks. He should be coming up now. Here we go. Hi, Steve. Hey, John, can you hear, can everybody hear me? Yep. Yes. Did you, did you catch the question? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much. You know, so so the the, the plan would be uh, that we go out to the SRF, the State Revolving Fund, and we borrow some money. Um, ideally, as you've heard in the presentation, some of the infiltration or the the new hookups will pay for that. But if it doesn't materialize quickly. Um, you know, we have $1.6 million in stabilization funds and also a million dollars in sewer free cash. And I just want to point out 
One, Excuse one, me, is that, is that a sewer stabilization fund? It is, Mr. Chairman. And okay, um, I just want to run one thing by Jack live and see how this goes. Jack, when you quoted four and a half million over 20 years at 2%, that gets you a $300,000 debt payment, you know, but, you know, the town of Acton, as you remember, um, I believe we have 30 year legislation out there that we adopted to try to push the payments out a little bit over the life of the, you know, of the loan. But if we did this over 30 years instead of uh, 20, it would cut that 300 down to 150 to 175. So to, to your question, um, the, uh, the town, the, the sewer enterprise fund would be funding those payments. And, um, you know, it's important to invest in our infrastructure and we do not, you know, we won't, we don't want to have a lot of deferred maintenance here. It's been, um, it's been run, I think, really well. And, uh, you know, as, as, as far as John Mangiarotti says, we're just trying to get the information out to the sewer commissioners on Article 5. And, and Steve, too, um, to add to that, the, um, the SRF will go to a 30-year 30 lo 30 loan, but the rate bumps up by about half a percent. But, but we see a bunch of communities do that. And, and it was also that housing production credit somehow. So, you know, it's just, you know, when you take a 20 year loan and push it out to 30, you, you know, you really get some inertia on that payment. And, you know, I think the point to us has been that those funds will provide some stability. Um, we could pay the debt service for years uh, if we had to um, without any worry. And, uh, but thank you, Jack. Uh, David, can I ask a question of uh, Steve Barrett? Um, uh, uh, Steve, uh, does 30 years make sense? Is at uh, considering that what we're seeing now is the useful life of many of these components is 20 years. Um, what, what, <laughs> that's we'll a great. Be, what, <laughs> no, what, Dave, we'll, that's a that's a that's a great point. Um, because I, guess in, I was good. I was just going to say, in 2040, if we need to buy new pumps and valves. Um, then we'd be paying, still paying off 10 years of loan and we need another loan. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, we, we got the special legislation, you know, 20 years ago, a lot of it was just to try to ease the, you know, the payment stream, uh, on, on that debt. Uh, you know, at this point, you know, the other thing I guess would be of information for the board uh, of commissioners would be our capitalization on that $25 million project was about $10 million on the, you know, the treatment plan and facility, and then $15 million in the collection system, just to kind of frame it for you. Okay, but uh, Steve, the source of the funds to repay the, the $4.5 million obligation over 20 years comes from, from whom? The sewer enterprise the fund. Sewer enterprise fund, okay. So yeah, the, there's, that's no basically the there's no betterment under uh, Article Five. There is no uh, betterment um, that will be issued. Uh, you know, the plan again is to is to use the reserves as a backstop if we need them, but just to take advantage of the of the infrastructure awards and the different things going on now. Um, you know, take advantage of it right now while the iron is hot and. Um, That'll actually buy down, in our minds, the uh, cost of the uh, rehab. Okay. Um, are there any further questions? Uh, Jim. Um, just a couple of quick things. Um, one is that I, I remember that every time I look at an aerial photo of anywhere in Acton, I always wonder if solar panels can go there. And uh, it does seem like there's a bunch of open space there. Uh, have you guys ever looked at um, solar panels uh, as a way of, you know, generating some of the uh, large amounts of electricity you need to use? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're going to look at that 10 years ago, uh, and we've more recently looked at it using the same vendor that we're using for the fire station roof, the, the North Acton fire station roof. Uh, and we're actually currently reviewing a proposal to. Uh, do some of the roof repairs along with solar panels, which I think we're not really comfortable if we want to do that yet, but that's something that we're currently looking at, uh, in addition to other opportunities that may be presented as we do this major rehab, which is the right time to 
to make some, some changes like this, um, right. like adding solar. So yes, that's definitely something that will we'll fold into this process. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, there seems to be a bunch of open space around the ribs as well. But, you know, you could have ground mounted solar there too. Or who knows, even floating solar panels. I don't know if they can float, but uh, it seems likely. Um, the only other comment I had was, there's one, there was one person last I checked raising their hand in the public, and we've got 28 participants so far, which is great. It's wonderful that people care enough about sewers and wastewater. Okay, um, are there any public comments from the audience? Uh, we do have two no. currently. The sure, let's first. Oh, sorry, Chair. Sure, please. Uh, the first will be from Richard Kelleher. Richard, mm -hmm. you should be able to speak. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I had um, a comment or a question on the graph of the sewer rate recommendation. Um, this, the sewer fund line is showing, showing going up. Uh, on the right side of the graph, which is current more towards the current year. And it doesn't show a drop. Won't it drop next year if you take money from the sewer fund to pay for this? Sure. Jack, would you go ahead and bring up that uh, slide again, please? Yep. I can ask you. Should come so, up now. So, so, Mr. Kelleher, what you're seeing there is the, the reserve balances in the blue bars okay. over the next four years, right? And the green line is what we expect for fiscal performance in each of the annual, uh, you know, sort of annual fiscal years. And so what, what you do see is a drop of well, some amount of money in order to um, bring down the reserve balances uh, while, while moderating reserve, pardon me, while moderating uh, rate increases. <coughs> Excuse me. I have a pickle in my throat. So you're saying that just the dip from 21 to 22 uh, is all that it takes to get this project funded? No, no, there will be, um, in the future, there will be increased revenue requirements, but um, a huge part of not having a major rate impact is having the additional customer base from South Acton come online. And then um, my second, I have three questions. The second one is, uh, about that topic, what if the Prada Mill apartments don't go ahead? I mean, is that, have you got that in the bank, so to speak, or a guarantee that they will pay, even if, say, they get a permitting hang up, are they fully permitted? They have run out of money, it's a crash, financial crash, unlikely, but you know. So we haven't factored that into the rates, is the actual truth. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is there would be, without the additional customer growth of South Acton and Powder Mill, uh, there would be a major rate increase in order to fund the debt service and operational requirements of your existing system. That's the and truth. With, with, and with the caveat that um, you could cover a couple years um, of that debt service with the stabilization fund, right, which would, would would hold that off, and any of the those new projects that tie in, those privilege fees could also pay for the debt service. And I know there's a handful of potential projects, um, so there's. I guess that that would yeah. be the backstop. But the that's backstop. absolutely correct. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, the state's going to require most of the things that virtually all of the things that are being uh, recommended here if you don't do them in the next couple of years anyway. So we're sort of st caught between a rock and a hard place. We have to pray that part of mill project goes ahead and, and, and comes up with their share of the money. We certainly hope for that, yes. And then the third question was just, a, or it wasn't really a question, just a, a comment. 
but I am concerned about discharge into zone two of the water district um, of their well. So um, have they weighed in on this? We, I mean, we've communicated with them in the, in the past, um, but the um, the ribs have been there for 20 years and, and they've been in operation. Um, our potential for finding a new discharge site, um, certainly staying outside of the zone two of any drinking water is our preference and, and that's what we are um, trying to do at this point. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Thank you, Richard. Um, Matt, are there uh, any other hands up? We do have a hand up from a call in user. Sure, uh, as a sure. reminder, please let us know your full name and where and after you're from when you are able to speak, which you should be able to now. Hi, it's Tara from West Jackson. Can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Yes. Um, so my first question is to Steve Barrett. Um, can I speak to him directly? Yeah. Um, Steve, I hope you're well. Um, I'm confused because when I was a select board member, whenever you came by with the rate increases, um, and I was concerned because they seemed high, and as it turned out, they were some of the highest in the state. Um, year after year, you were telling, reassuring us that the rates included rehab and included saving for replacement, and that there would be no big capital projects. So my first question is, what happened? So thank you, Tara, for that question. Um, so. Yeah, we've been in the uh, O&M business for almost 20 years now, and over time we've put uh, together, again, if you look at the 1.6 million and the in stabilization and a million in free cash, you know, that's 2.6 million uh, that we put aside. Um, true, it's not the four and a half million. Uh, you know, I think at times we struggle with high rates, as you pointed out, and if anything, probably the last 10 years, I think we've had uh, no rate hikes six or seven years just trying to keep down the cost. So, you know, if anything, you know, I, I, maybe we, we kept down the cost too much to the, to the O&M users, but, you know, it was just, uh, you know, that's kind of, you know, we, we put in the rates we believe are necessary, but over the last few years, you know, we've, uh, you know, we haven't been running a surplus and, you know, with COVID, we weren't able to get in front of the board or I wasn't able to get there. It's just, it's been, uh, it's been a little crazy, but, you know, I think you're right. We're not, we do not have a hundred percent of this money put aside. That That's correct. And so how much of the money was set aside? Is it 1.3 million? No, I mean, I'd look at it as, um, 1.6 million plus our free cash of a million or close to a million is 2.6 million. So we have roughly 50%, you know, of the, uh, of the money set aside in cash. And so how much of the article five will help with expansion? That's not, Matt, do you want to jump in or? <laughs> It says the Article 5 uh, handles the rehabilitation of the existing infrastructure. And so none of the spending will assist or position the system to be expandable? It will, it will, it will modernize the equipment, um, but it's not going to be adding any new pipes uh, up to any new places. So it will, it, it will increase the capacity of like the controllers and the valves or I mean so yeah right. it was built 20 years ago and this this uh, rehabilitation will bring it up to the most modern uh, controls and systems that we need to operate the, the plant um, effectively so that we can you know invest something that we can invest in for long term it'll be paid off over a long term uh, while we're using it Thank you. And my last question is about the betterments or the privilege fees or whatever it is, the 230 users at $30,000 each that other people are paying would be about 6.9 million, but somehow the developer is only paying 500,000. I'm a little confused about that. Uh, 
Yeah, well, the, the agreement with the developer, which um, was executed by the select board, um, I would say about 18 months ago, maybe longer, um, was based on the rate structure in place at the time, which was not 30,000 um, per unit. It was closer to 12, I believe. I think. And so I don't remember a town meeting vote to allow the um, the Powder Mill Place to be relieved of its better mix. I thought that the um, the way that the sewer law is structured, that the better mix has to be paid um, by anybody joining the system. No, that, that's not accurate. Did, did I misunderstand it? Is it just the expansion cost that it would have to be covered? The question, I believe, uh, is a little bit uh, difficult to answer the way it was structured, so I'm sorry. Do uh, you, you want to re-ask re it? Or, um, yeah, I think I'm just curious as to why it's like, okay, so the original system was like 10 million or did you say 15? Whatever it was, it was around that. And so what we're talking about is like 50% of the original cost of the system to be to bring it up to speed. Um, and then I don't quite understand how how the suddenly now we've got this project you know the fire mill place people are in favor of that so that's a good thing um but it just seems weird that the current users will be on the hook for um a very large um chunk of change at the same time that this developer seems to have in fact gotten away with paying only five hundred thousand. so it just seems a little bit and i guess that the board of selectmen have the um, right to do that, I would just be concerned that 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 the current users are getting the short and thick of things. That's all. Thank you. Well, just to address that, that wasn't really a question, but if I could just address that, please. So the the way you characterize the number of agreement agreement with the developer is inaccurate um, in several ways, um, but I think that. Um, you know, and that's posted on our website if you want to review it. Okay, um, Matt, are there any further citizen comments? Uh, we do have one from Melissa Nickel. Sure. Alyssa, you should be able to speak. Thanks, this is Alyssa Nickel on School Street. Um, I was wondering if it's known how many housing units are in the South Acton sewer district that have not yet hooked up to the sewer? Well, here, Jack, do we, do we know that? <clears throat> we can calculate that. I don't have that number offhand. Um, okay. if, um, if the graph or, or spreadsheet that you uh, promised to send to Mr. Snyder Grant, if that could be placed in the docu-share so it's available to the public, that would be much appreciated. We'll do that. Thank you. Um, and I also want to um, just state that I, I share Ms. Frederick's concerns about the the payment from Powder Mill Place. Um, we hooked up to sewer um, because uh, the home that we bought, the Title V uh, inspection failed. And our betterment was, I be believe, about $12,000. Um, so if what Mr. Mondrati is saying, the units for Powder Mill Place, the betterment was about twelve. dollars Thousand. Um, if you multiply that by 230 units, you should get closer to $3 million and not $500,000. Um, so I do share concern as a South Acton sewer user that um, current users are going to be on the hook for this um, upgrade while the 230 new users that are coming in at Powder Mill Place um, seem to have gotten a, a significant break. So I just wanted to share that concern. John, can I respond? Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's not true, right? So the, the total amount that the Potter Mill Place is putting into the um, sewer district is just being done for the most part in, in infrastructure rather than money. 
And so they're, they're adding pumping station, piping, and other things to the um, system, plus um, $500,000 for whatever improvements we want to do to the plant. So that $500,000 is on top of what they're already already in, investing. And, in, um, and at the time we did this, this was more that money than the um, then current privilege fee structure, which we have since increased. But at the time, um, it was more than the, the privilege fee structure and more than the privilege fee structure that existing uh, users uh, uh, paid. And, and in addition to that, anybody that we allowed to hook up um, between Powder Mill Place um, and the, the wastewater treatment plant will play, pay the sewer enterprise fund um, a privilege fee. Um, and that money goes into the sewer enterprise fund. So not only are they paying for uh, the infrastructure, including, a net, like I said, a pumping station and stuff, they are, um, we get the money back from that if other, we allow others to come. Okay, great. That additional information is super helpful. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you, David. Um, were there any, uh, is that it, Matt, on, on citizen comments? We do have one more from Kim sure. Castens. Sure, sure, please. Kim, you should be able to speak. Thank you. Uh, this is Kim Castens from Hope Road. I am not in the city of the um, sewer district. Um, my household is not in the sewer district. Um, but as I follow this conversation, I'm sensing a lot of, um, uh, and other um, uh, conversations around sewer issues, I'm sensing a lot of um, uncertainty and um, suspicion and discomfort. And I'm feeling that from the perspective of good governance, there's kind of a conflict of interest here in the sense that it's one organization, one company that has it is advising the town on what was needed, is putting the plan together, and is going to profit from doing it. And um, I'm just suggesting that it might be wise to get an independent evaluation, um, in particular of um, exactly what the state is going to require and how soon the state's going to require it and what the options are. So my basic comment here is just to advise our elected officials to consider um, going after an independent um, assessment of these costs and priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. <coughs> Are there any further citizen comments, Matt? Uh, that seems to do it. Okay, so are there any further questions or comments from uh, select board members? Okay, so uh, so John, as I understand it, um, the um, the, uh, the rehabilitation project will be Article Five at town meeting, and what we heard tonight was a preview of of, the, of, of that article. And then before the end of the fiscal year, we will the sewer commission will reconvene and vote on the recommended sewer rates. Yes, that is the uh, proposed plan of action. Okay. Okay. So we'll take off our sewer commissioner hats and uh, get back. By the way, Jim, uh, get back into the uh, the, the regular meeting. Uh, we are at a few minutes after 7 o'clock. We do have a, a public hearing at 7.10. So why don't we begin with, um, if, uh, begin with citizen concerns. Um, just at the outset, um, uh, these, these comments that uh, I'm not going to be taking any further comments, either pro or con, on the on the status of the chair and we have a very full agenda tonight um again all in the run-up to um town meeting um a little more than a month from now um so if uh you know make your comments um you know count if they can be deferred to a later meeting uh that would be helpful so, uh, Mr. Chair, I don't think we should be censoring people's comments. I think people okay. should be able to say what they want. Okay. 
Are there any comments? Um, we have Kim K. Oh, sorry, Kim Castens again. I'm not sure if sure, her hand is up from. Oh, she just dropped. Our first comment will be from Joseph Connor. Joseph O'Connor. Mm -hmm. That's Chief O'Connor. He's here for the later item. Okay. I believe. Um, so, are there any citizen comments? Um, yep, we'll hear from Corey Sallow. Sure. I'm sorry, I clicked on the wrong person. Corey, you should be able to speak now. Thank you, and thank you, David, for speaking up about letting us make um, comments as we see fit, because I do want to share a um, statement that Racial Justice for Black Lives emailed to the select board, but we wanted to share it during a meeting for others to hear as well. Okay. So we write this letter in response to John Benson's statements at the Acton Select Board meetings on April 5th and April 12th, 2021. On April 5th, Mr. Benson inappropriately singled out members of our community, imploring Senator Eldridge to speak to the Evelyn Obias, the Kira Wilson Cooks, the Amy Krishna Murthys, the Mike Rothbaums, the Leela Ramachandran's and really have a heart to heart with them about what they said about him during the election. Beyond the obvious point of rudely referring to each of these individuals as quote, the before their names and failing to specify what the individual specifically said, Mr. Benson's comments were condescending an abuse of his position as the chair of the select board and simply put white supremacy at its core. Mr. Benson's comments are a call for silence and inaction. Ms. Ramachandran was a former student at Acton Boxborough High School, is currently attending college, and is a tireless advocate for racial justice while also serving in a volunteer position as a member of Acton's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. It's unclear to which statements Mr. Benson was referring as, quote, untrue, as Ms. Ramachandran's public comments all provided citations to Mr. Benson's statements. Then on April 12th, Mr. Benson again used his position as the chair of the select board to comment on his interactions with school committee member, Kira Cook. Only met one member of the select board spoke out against Mr. Benson's statements. The rest of the select board sat in silence while Mr. Benson continued with his statement. We would expect members of a governing board to speak up against injustice. A leader would graciously accept defeat and admit that Acton, in all its glory, still has much work to be done in the areas of racial equity, or sorry, equality and justice. That is leadership. To those who think we are divided and that our community is not racist, we will leave you with one of many powerful quotes from Robin D'Angelo, the author of White Fragility. Quote, to continue reproducing racial inequality, the system only needs for white people to be really nice and carry on, to smile at people of color, to go to lunch with them on occasion, to be clear, being nice is generally a better policy than being mean, but niceness does not bring racism to the table and will not keep it on the table when so many of us who are white want it off. Niceness does not break with white solidarity and white silence. In fact, naming racism is often seen as not nice, triggering white fragility, end quote. It is our hope that we all seek to do better in working to ensure justice and equal rights for the black, indigenous, and person of color members of our community, a meaningful political voice and a sense of belonging. Lunch, coffee, and $250 is not enough. Thirty so seconds. Great. With hope, racial justice for black lives. Thank you. Are there any other um, citizen comments? No. We do. Uh, Melissa Nichol is up next. Melissa, you should be able to speak. Thanks so much. This is Alyssa Nichol from School Street. Um, as uh, Mr. Benton just mentioned, there is a special town election on June 29th to fill a seat on this board. While that special town election is only six weeks away, it is not yet listed on the calendar on the town website or anywhere on the homepage. Thankfully, there's mention in the manager's update of the May Municipal Monthly, but you have to open the Municipal Monthly to read this information. And there's no information about voter registration. The deadline is June 9th, requesting a ballot or the names of the candidates available. I'd like to see this information highlighted in a separate news flash update on the homepage as soon as possible. An announcement 
about the special town election can also be posted on the town's message board trailers located at the intersection of 2A and 27 and the transfer station. It can also be posted to the town's social media handles. Another point that I want to make relative to elections, I've noticed that campaigns in Acton have a long history of endorsements from elected and appointed board and committee members. The State Ethics Commission clearly prohibits endorsements by appointed board and committee members using their official titles. They're considered public employees for the purposes of the conflict of interest law. Section 23B2II of the conflict of interest law prohibits the use of one's public position to engage in political activity because a public employee who does so is using his official position to secure for himself or others, such as a candidate or a ballot question committee, unwarranted privileges of substantial value that are not properly available to similarly situated persons. Public employees may not, if appointed, use a public title while campaigning. If appointed, use a public title to endorse a candidate. So while an elected select board or school committee member may use his or her title while endorsing a candidate, an appointed member of any board or committee, such as Finance Committee, Acting Community Housing Corporation, Open Space Committee, Planning Board, etc., may not. Likewise, a candidate who is currently an appointed member of a committee or board should not use his or her title when campaigning. So while a candidate might acknowledge current service by naming the committee on which he or she serves, using the title Economic Development Committee Chair, for example, is an ethics violation. It makes complete sense that an appointed official should not be endorsing a candidate who has power of appointment over that individual. It also makes sense that if the town is committed to improving accessibility and inclusion and welcoming participation in town government, even those elected officials who are permitted to use their public office title when endorsing a candidate might choose not to do so. I'd like to see all of us adhere to state ethics guidelines and demand integrity from those who serve in our town government. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Next up, we'll hear from Char Charlie Cadillac. Charlie, you should be able to speak. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. As you all probably know, I am very much uh, in favor of public comment at all public boards and committees. Uh, so I applaud Mr. Martin for uh, his comment about censorship, but I have a question for him. Is he going to allow public comment at the DEIC commission? You want me to respond? Please. Yeah, do we have traditionally not taken public comment at the DEIC? It's not really, uh, you know, part of our, our purpose. So um, uh, we just typically have not taken any. Well, I suggest you may want to reconsider it. You might find some interesting information if you allow it. Okay, I want to make clear that we don't censor anybody. You know, we don't say some people can speak and some people can't speak. We just typically do not take public comment. That's kind of overall censorship. Thank you. Uh, I think we do have one more comment from a call-in user. I believe sure. it's Lisa, um, but if you could let us know who you are when you come up to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. I believe that the DIC is specifically has that policy to keep the environment safe, um, and I agree with that. Um, but this is a general citizen's comment, so I appreciate the ability to speak. Um, I, I want to say that, John, um, you've done a lot for the town. Not that I, not everything I agree with, as you know. I'm sad about the tree at Kelly's Corner for car convenience and the risk of people with disabilities, the lack of planning to prevent undue destruction. But glad that you came around and became a strong advocate to save the vernal schools, Pepper Lane, et cetera, I could go on. I don't suspect that you'll leave service of the town, and I hope that you take the opportunity while you're still in office to apologize um, to the people that were offended, and I hope that you engage in the personal work required to understand how racial justice can be achieved, including engaging in humility that's required to have an inclusive community. I know it's hard work. I know personally. And I invite you to sit down with those who really know how to do this work. David Martin, I've had my differences with him about the sewers and pushing expansion to cost residents, whatever. But he has really done stellar work in terms of inclusivity, and I hope you engage with him. 
And I hope you do apologize to me while you can. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Okay. And that is it for public comment. So that's for public comment. So um, let's jump before we do chairs update, managers update um, uh, to our hearing, our 710 hearing. Um, under um, MGLE 140 section 58, the Act and Select Board will hold a public hearing on May 17 at 710 p.m. remotely by video conference and call in on the application of Acton um, Auto Boutique for a class two auto dealer's license at 429 Great Road, Acton Mass 01720. From a computer, enter into the link ID actonma.gov uh, slash meeting slash BOS, or from a telephone dial 646-876-9923 and enter into the webinar ID 503-918-785. Telephone users may dial star nine to request to speak after join after joining the meeting. Computer and app users may use the raise hand feature to request to speak. Um, John, would you like to introduce the applicant? Thank you. Uh, the the applicant is present in, as a panel and. Um, Maybe we better introduce himself. I'm sorry. I don't know the full team, so I don't want him to speak. Hi, good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Adam? Uh, yes, good evening. My name is Adam Ponzi. I'm the attorney that represents Michael Milano Picardi and Acton Auto Boutique LLC, the applicant for the Class 2 Auto Dealers License. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present this evening. I'm just going to show you who's with me. I have Michael Milano Picardi. Hello. And I also have. Oleg McDalski, and then also on the Zoom um, should be Zachary Eaton and our commercial landlord, Leo Bertolami. I believe he's with uh, Mr. Eaton. Um, so if I, if I may proceed, is that okay? Please. Okay. So as you all may know, um, Acton Auto Boutique LLC has applied for a Class 2 auto dealer's license in connection with the commercial tenancy at 429 Great Road. Uh, it's a brand new property and it's perfectly suited for uh, auto dealership. Um, with me tonight, Mr. Milano Picardi and his team are looking to bring a unique luxury European focused um, car buying experience in this area of Acton. And I think from, and if you have questions for them, but really the, the experience they're looking to provide to customers is a, is a non-pressure type intimate um, auto buying experience. So just by way of brief background, um, Mr. Milano Picardi and his family, um, they owned and operated the Union Oyster House in Boston for decades. Um, Michael has, has made the decision to depart that um, business venture and is now pursuing his lifelong dream of owning uh, a luxury car dealership. Um, Mr. McDalski, will be the customer facing sales manager for the business. He brings in excess of 10 years of experience, two years as the head manager of the luxury foreign um, service dealership. Also um, five years with the German auto parts wholesaler, and most recently the head of procurement for vehicles for a luxury dealership out of Newton. Um, with us is also Mr. Zachary Eaton, who has more than 12 years of experience in the industry. He will serve as the business's uh, director of finance. Um, and his prior um, experience includes working for the financial department for Herb Chambers, and also serving as a regional territory manager for a Boston-based automotive funding group. And most recently, the director of finance for a luxury uh, group out of Newton, Massachusetts. The team also anticipates bringing a service manager in excess of 10 years of experience and a properly licensed um, European auto uh, technician, again, within excess of 10 years of experience. Um, speaking to the application itself, um, importantly, the proposed hours of operation are Monday to Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., Sundays by appointment only. As you'll see in the application, I know that uh, vehicle storage is very important total of 35 vehicles to be stored at the premises, 17 in the exterior, 
18 on the interior, including the showroom. And then specifically in terms of the business, um, general umbrella liability coverage with respect to workers' compensation, proof of that coverage and the certificate of insurance has been submitted with the application with an effective date of June 1st, 2021. We've also submitted proof of the um, required secondhand auto dealers bond with Western surety and the penal sum of 25,000. That's been effective since April 23rd of 2021. Um, and then last but not least, you know, I, I appreciate, um, I believe the only comment we've received um, has been from the building commissioner, understandably, um, as the landlord is completing um, some construction work at the premises, some lighting fixtures, some, some flooring. And uh, Mr. Bertolami is here in the event there's questions about the property. Um, so with that all being said, you know, my clients really appreciate this opportunity to do business in your wonderful community. Um, they do believe that this business is needed in your town. And it's been a really nice, unique opportunity to link up with a commercial landlord who he himself has decades of experience in the automotive industry. So this, for us, has been a match made in heaven. Um, we're really excited about the property. Um, so I'm not sure if there's any other questions or if I've gone on for too long, but I just wanted to give you um, your select board a, just an overall picture of what we're proposing. So with that being said, we respectfully request um, that the select board approve our application for a class two license. Thank you so much. Yes, Mr. Pont, uh, th that was a very fine presentation on your part. Um, are there any questions or comments from board members? Uh, Jim. Um, so I went back and looked at the, uh, the 2016 uh, special site permit just to, make, just to make sure if there were any questions or concerns that the, that the board at that time had raised. Um, and it, everything looked in order to me. Um, I, I feel like this, this step is the natural next step uh, uh, coming, after that, uh, coming after that special permit approval. And uh, I wish you luck. I mean, if it was my preference, you'd put in a couple car chargers and sell some of those fancy European electric cars. But I realize I can't make that a condition. Well, thank you so much. And that's definitely something that's on the table. You know, these guys are not set in their ways. They just want to bring a good luxury experience. So thank you very much. David? Uh, yes, I just wanted to class two licenses used cars only. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, is there going to be any uh, uh, automotive service at the site? Yes. And so we have worked directly with the Board of Health, Matthew Dow, um, and we have a hearing with the Board of Health on June 7th, and we received written confirmation that our submission on the hazardous materials was proper and sufficient. And I'm happy to, pro I think I provided a copy of that to, I'm so sorry, I don't know how to say her last name, Miss Tommel. Um, Tom. So yeah, if you... But I'm happy to send that to anyone else who wants to see that submission. Yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I can get it from her. Can you just tell me how many service bays there are? It's going to be four, four. service bays. Okay, four. thank you. And and uh, uh, overall, uh, what, what is the, I can find this out, but I just don't know, what, what's the uh, acreage of the site in total? Mr. Bertolami, do you know the acreage off the top of your head? You're, you're muted. Mr. Pavani. There you go. One point four three, one point six three. It's in. It's over an acre, but it's under two. Yeah, an acre and a half. Really works. Good. Good. Th thank you. That that's that's that. Uh, um, close enough for me. Th thank you. No more questions. Sure. Any uh, further questions or comments from board members? So then do I have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Is there a second? A second, second. charter. Uh, David, if you call the roll, please. Uh, Mr. Snyder Grant? Aye. Ms. Gardner? Aye. Mr. Charter? Aye. Mr. Benson? Aye. And I say aye, so we're closed. Okay, um, would I have a motion then um, to approve the application of Acton Auto Boutique for a Class Two Auto Dealers License at 429 Great Road in, in Acton. So, um, a second. There, second day. Uh, 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 motion, uh, Joan. Second, David. Um, is there any further discussion? Okay. So, David, you call the roll, please. Uh, Mr. Snyder Grant. 
Aye. Ms. Gardner? Aye. Mr. Charter? Aye. Mr. Benson? Aye. And I say I select unanimous. Okay. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Have a good night. Thank good you. Evening. Thank you, Select Board. Thank you all very much. So, um, so uh, back to regular business. Uh, for the chair's update, um, um, at the um, Action Community Housing Corporation's monthly meeting last Monday, um, Steve Jonkis, who is the um, developer of the residences at, at Kelly's Corner, announced that the new name um, of the development will be Tavernier Place in honor of Nancy Tavernier and her many years of, thank you, Jim, and her many years of work for um, affordable housing in, in our community. And there will be a, a groundbreaking coming up in a dedication um, as well later this summer. That's that, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, Nancy was totally ca caught off guard with with that announcement. That was kept under wraps for at least three years that I know. Um, just a reminder to the uh, 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 to board members, there's a, a Mass Municipal Association web a webinar this Thursday, May 20th from 3 to 4 p.m. on the Treasury guidelines on the use of um, ARPA um, funds. Acton will receive $6.9 million. Those are the federal guidelines. We'll start there, and then we'll see what the state, uh, what adjustments the state makes to that. But that's good information to have in the program to your And then uh, just a reminder that our next meeting will be next Monday night at 7 o'clock, um, where we'll um, um, review and make our recommendations on the town meeting warrant articles. Um, uh, we will do John's evaluation. And then there will be um, an executive session to discuss his compensation, which will be voted on in public session at our meeting um, on June 7th. So that is my report. John, for the manager's update, please. Thank you. Just a few items. Uh, we were very honored last week to have Lieutenant Governor Karen Pluto uh, come to Acton, uh, members of the select board. Uh, our state delegation uh, were in attendance to announce a celebration uh, for the $2.75 million that we received from the MassWorks grant program. Um, it's a great program providing infrastructure to support uh, economic development projects. In this case, uh, it's been awarded to the town to help support the Powder Mill Place project. We'll be using it for uh, wastewater and complete streets improvements on the uh, Powder Mill Road corridor. Uh, so it was great to have that celebration. We were, we've been trying to have it for six months, and it kept getting delayed and postponed. And so it was nice to, to actually have it and, and have a nice sunny day. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, speaking of a lot of fun, um, Saturday is hazmat day. So um, if you have things that you need to get rid of in your garage, you can bring them over to the transfer station uh, this Saturday, 9, 9 to 1130. Uh, the most popular item that people bring is paint. But don't forget that if it's latex paint, you can actually throw it out if you just dry it out at your house. Um, the transfer, speaking of the transfer station, will be resuming normal uh, operating hours starting June 1st. Um, if you recall, during this pandemic, we added an additional day on Mondays, uh, and that will be discontinued on June 1st. Uh, so actually, the last actual Monday, I think, is uh, May 24th, uh, because the following one is Memorial Day. So, back to Tuesday to Saturday schedule um, at the transfer station. And another item is we're doing a lot of hiring. Um, we we have a lot of positions open right now. We're doing the best we can to get the word out. Uh, there's positions in public works, in land use, um, public safety, uh, finance, communication. So people that are out there that have skills and talents and want to come work with us, uh, we'd love to, to have you. Um, we want to get some we're excited about the potential of bringing in some new, new people and uh, look forward to uh, making some announcements once we make these hires uh, later this summer. Then finally, uh, we had to schedule two additional ALG meetings, uh, Acting Leadership Group meetings. Uh, at the meeting on Thursday, we discussed that um, 
and the current ALG plan needs to be adjusted because we uh, include a debt service amount for the cost of the North Acton Fire Station. We've included it as its own separate line item to try to be extra transparent to people about what we're spending on it. Uh, but we actually also included it in the operating budget um, expense. So uh, to to uh, resolve that issue, we'll have a, a, a surplus in the bottom line of the ALG plan. So the group had preliminary discussions last week about how we can address that. Uh, do we uh, use it to help plug potential revenue shortfalls? Do we look at other ways uh, to address that? This board, uh, it'll be on your agenda, I believe on May 24th, uh, subject to the chair confirming that. Yes, and that, then, that will be on for the 24th as well. And then uh, that'll give ALG representatives from this board time to go back to ALG on the 27th and if necessary on the 3rd. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that you all were aware of that. Yeah, I think uh, John sent out a, a, um, a, an email to us this, this evening with the latest ALG spreadsheet and a summary of what he um, I just laid out with the, with the potential options, and we'll be discussing that next Monday night. So member minutes, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, let's see. Um, first of all, I got to say, I'm. St this is the first I heard about um, uh, Nancy Tavernier's name being used, uh, and I just I'm still like I'm very moved by that. I think that's a wonderful tribute to the amazing work she's done uh, on on affordable housing for uh, for many decades. Um, the only other thing I had was, um, so uh, since so many of our most difficult conversations over the last year have started with this uh, May, May 25th um, death of George Floyd, I was happy to I'm happy to announce that um, there'll be a, um, a, a special event uh, in Acton on that day. Um, it's going to be a, a remembrance service for George Floyd, followed by a, a community conversation with the Acton Boxborough police chiefs. So I think it's a it's a it's a wonderful chance to um, kind of bring bring us together um, in in a on a topic that's been hard for the, us to have relaxed conversations about. Um, the, the Where will that be, Jim? That's going to be a Zoom event. Um, it's um, you can get uh, invitation information by writing to racial justice or black lives at gmail.com. They're the one of the groups that's sponsoring it and they're handling the they're handling the invites. So it's racial justice for black lives at gmail.com. Uh, it starts at 6:30 though there's a zoom invite that they can send you. And um, they're, they're especially for so for those of you in the audience that are um, that that are, are black or people of color. There's a sp special hope that you may be able to attend and or that you could send in um, questions or comments ahead of time to that email address um, so that they can be uh, addressed at the meeting. Um, thanks. That's it. Uh, Jim, can I clarify with Jim? Was that sure. a digit digit four in that email address? Oh, thank you for asking. Uh, no, that's the word for. It's the word for. Sorry. Yes. Thank, cool. thank you. Uh, Joan. No, I'm all set. Uh, David. Uh, y yes. Uh, at the past couple of select board meetings, our diversity, equity, and inclusion commission has been the target of criticism. I've been trying to focus on the town's business, despite the rancor of uh, select board meetings in April. But as liaison and a member of the DEIC, I feel that I need to respond. Like every other board and committee in town, the DEIC is composed of residents who volunteer their time to benefit the town. The DEIC has to deal with many difficult issues. The work of the DEIC is personally unsettling and stressful for all the members of the commission. DEIC meetings are public, of course. There are reasoned discussions of policy and wording. There's no hot-headedness or name-calling as some have implied. The role of advisory committees like the DEIC is to advise the select board in their area of expertise. Recently, the DEIC advised the select board members not to support the baseless attacks by the chair of this board on some residents of Acton, including elected officials, school committee members, and a member of the DEIC itself. I attempted to have the vice chair take over to defend the honor of this board and the civil and cooperative way that we usually manage differences of opinion in, in Acton. 
However, a majority of this board, including the vice chair, continued to support the chair after his inappropriate actions. This was extremely disheartening heartening to me personally and to hundreds of residents who have contacted the board and signed petitions objecting to the chair's action. Some people object that the DEIC chose to criticize the select board at all, but I appreciate that they had the courage to do so. It's not easy to speak truth to power. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dean. Uh, nothing from me, thank you. Okay, um, John, um, COVID-19 response update? Thank you. Uh, just to give you an update on where we are from a case standpoint, today we've had 975 people uh, with COVID in, in Acton. Uh, there are currently six active cases, which is the lowest it's been in quite a while, which is very encouraging. Uh, the governor made some pretty big announcements today about reopening and about the state of emergency. Uh, the, the, one of the answers was that all remaining COVID-19 restrictions will be lifted effective May 29th, which is in two weeks um, or so. And also that the Commonwealth's face covering order will be rescinded on May 29th as well. And uh, finally, that the state of emergency related to the COVID pandemic will end on June 15th. So uh, the Board of Health actually had recently taken a vote to align all of its orders with the state orders. So no you know, specific actions that need to be taken by the Board, Board of Health on that issue, but uh, we do need to have a conversation with, with this board and others on how we're going to operate uh, after June 15th. Uh, and I think I'll be prepared to make some recommendations on that, probably for your first June meeting, which I think is the 7th. And I'll be working with the team uh, between now and then. And anything that um, needs to be addressed ahead of that, um, I will get to you ahead of that. But it's interesting. I think we've all been planning for this, uh, but it's always been out on the horizon, but now it's actually here. So it's very good news. Uh, we've been open here for public business and town hall for a few weeks, uh, several weeks now, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's going really well, no, no, no issues, and I expect that to continue. Uh, one other thing regarding the American Rescue Plan funds, um, as the chair mentioned, this webinars, there, there's been a few webinars, um, MMA is doing another one, and we're still trying to pour through all these guidelines and, and um, I hope to have some more information for you on that um, in terms of how it, it impacts us and what ideas we have for that June meeting as well, uh, if not soon thereafter. Any questions for John or Jim? Um, so part of the governor's proclamation, as I recall, is what allows us to uh, meet remotely, uh, both as a select board and all of our boards and committees. So it sounds like what you're saying is that by June 15, we, we, we need to uh, revert to the earlier requirements about meeting, which require, for example, the chair to be there in person, uh, for there to be a quorum in person, as I recall. Um, and is that part of what you're going to be working so, out with staff? Yeah, the next period there's been a lot of talk amongst the, the, uh, people in this business about that this may potentially find a way to get extended because it's been so successful. In many ways, it's been very successful for civic engagement and getting people involved. You have 100 people show up to a meeting that you know we may usually get 15. So it's something that across the state people have recognized as, as a tool to get more people involved. So I hope that it'll it'll be extended seamlessly, but if it's not, uh, we'll be ready to start meeting in person. We'll, we'll make sure of it. Thanks. Any, uh, Dean? Yeah, I, as regards the state of emergency, uh, I've, I've gotten a lot of input from various opinions from folks in town. Uh, certainly, Zoom has made some governmental meetings a lot more accessible, but I think there's a lot of downside to uh, not meeting in person. So personally, I I think that we should uh, look forward to its reopening and having in-person meetings face-to-face. -face. Uh, I think that the uh, it's important to do that. I think there's a lot of nuance that's lost during the Zoom meetings. And I think there might be a lot more cordiality in in-person meetings and certainly want to make sure that uh, 
to do the maximum extent possible. All public meetings are carried on Acton TV or YouTube or certainly be accessible. But I don't really think that uh, there's much future in continuing for a long period of time with, uh, with this kind of Zoom situation. Just my opinion. Uh, David. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of things to figure out here. Um, you know, the, the, I, as I would understand it, unless there's another order by the governor, it goes back to the way Jim said, and there's uh, particular uh, um, steps you have to take when one member is remote. Um, and, um, uh, but, you know, I think we also have to consider whether we want to allow um, people to participate remotely, you know, ask questions remotely, and for what meetings, right? Um, certainly for the big meetings like select board, where we, we can have a facilitator, uh, you know, let people speak and we have a big screen in room 204 and things like that. Um, th that's practical, but it may not be practical for the smaller meetings um, to ha uh, have participants uh, meet remotely. And if we do, we have to ha accommodate that somehow, right? If the, you know, choose, choose your committee, the, the planning board is, me is meeting in, in town hall um, and, you know, they don't normally have a facilitator. Um, how do they admit people, you know, remotely to speak or any other board or committee? Um, uh, so uh, I, I think we, we're going to need policies around those uh, things um, as to which, which meetings we think need facilitators and which ones don't. And, uh, you know, I think there's a whole host of questions. John, anything further? No, thanks. Uh, John, just one final yeah, thing on this topic. Um, I particularly call the, I particularly note that the Commission on Disabilities has had a, a wonderful revival of participation um, made possible by the ability of people to participate remotely. Um, so, uh, you know, having, having some sort of hybrid solutions available so that some people can be in person and some people can participate remotely would would be a real help for for the, the, the mission of the of the commission on disabilities thank you okay um when do we move on to um new um special business and the first item is to discuss the open meeting law complaint um dated um May 10th, 2021, um, it was filed by uh, Stephen Ballard of Boxborough. And um, John and I have been in contact um, with, with, with Nina Pickering Cook. And um, the um, suggestion was for Lisa Tommel to re-watch the segment of the meeting that was the subject you know, of the complaint and to provide a more detailed summary of the comments that were made during the segment and um, for those minutes to be completed this week to be in the packet that we receive for next Monday's meeting we we'll review those minutes and revote them um, next Monday night. Does that make sense to the group? Jim. Um. Well, when I, when I looked through the open meeting law requirements for minutes, I was struck that the, the requirements are very particularly focused on decision making. What goes into making a decision? What are the documents? What are the, the main points uh, that lead up to, uh, you know, particular votes and decisions? Because that's the intent of the open meeting law is to avoid the sort of backroom deal making. Um, so to me, uh, I, I didn't see merit in the complaint. Uh, I, I thought um, the complaint was about items that were uh, at citizens' concerns and at um, manager minutes and member minutes that were not part of a, of a particular deliberation. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I, I defer to town council, but I, I'd be comfortable with uh, with an approach that just said, "Sorry, no." Yeah, um, David, you're you're going to unmute. Sorry, um, I I also think that the fact that um, that our, the meetings are recorded and the video is available on YouTube 
um, means that also that there's no vacuum deal. And if someone wants to hear uh, the complete comments of, of anybody who made a, uh, 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 you know, a statement before th this board, they can go hear the, the full text in their own words. Um, um, so I, I'm uh, happy with either solution, but uh, uh, Mr. Chair, as I understand it, we have to vote on this remedy. Is that correct? Uh, so it, whatever remedy we choose, if we choose what Jim said uh, and just say, no, we're happy the way it is, or if we do what you suggested um, and, uh, and, and ask um, uh, Lisa Tommel to go in and uh, uh, update the, the, the minutes and we re-vote on them. Uh, I believe in either case, uh, if someone can correct me if I'm wrong, that requires that we, someone make a motion and we vote on it. Yeah, um, let me just, uh, to, to help uh, uh, Jim out, um, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, the whole, the, the underlying purpose of the open meeting law is to prevent chicanery. Um, but, um, you know, the, the balance you're trying to make here is that um, um, each topic that comes up during a meeting, the minutes must have a, a summary of what was discussed, not a verbatim transcript, but just more of a summary. And given that, you know, the length that um, that discussion, that segment went on, um, uh, Nina's recommendation to us that it, it should have um, ha had, had more heft to, you know, the summary that was, that was in there. Uh, the purpose, when we, we're required under the open meeting law to discuss the complaint as we're doing now. And typically we instruct the town manager and the town council to, um, um, you know, to respond on our behalf. Uh, Nina said in this particular case, it doesn't have to go that far. We don't need to respond. Just the action that we should take is have, Nina, have Lisa review the tape and uh, give a more um, um, a healthy, you know, summary of what was said, given that it, you know, it, it went on uh, what she thought was for a better part of an hour between the, the public comments and then board, my comments and the board's comments. Um, and that was the reason for it. So you're saying we don't need a vote in either case? Um, well, um, I, 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 I would then make make this motion um, that we um, um, ask our executive assistant Lisa Tomble to rewatch the segment of the meeting and provide a more detailed summary of the comments and have those uh, the revised minutes go out in this Thursday's packet for us to review and then revote the minutes um, at our meeting next Monday night. I, I would second that. Um, there are, uh, Mr. Chair, there are, I don't know if you want to take comments. There are two people with their hands raised. Um, uh, uh, Matt? Is Matt Murphy there? Yes. Yeah, you're in charge of this, yeah. First if, off, if, there are if there are comments? There are two. I believe this is Tara, it's a call -in user. But if you could confirm who you are, that'd be great. Uh, this is Tara from West Acton, and I had my hand raised for the for the auto dealer thing, and you went straight to closing the hearing, so I never got to speak on that. I'm sorry. Um, I am sending in my comments, but I would like the opportunity to say something for about 30 seconds. Would that be okay? On what, the auto dealer? Yeah. Well, the hearing's closed. Could yeah, you wanna... closed the hearing with public copy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Offer... All right, why don't you take... Um, we're, do you have a comment on the matter on the open meeting law complaint? So, Mr. Chair, maybe we could come back to uh, Ms. Fredericks after we finish the open meeting law just to allow her to make her comment. Okay. Uh, on the auto dealer. Although the hearing's closed, you understand. I, I understand, but. And the uh, action's taken. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, are there any other comments on the open meeting law complaint? We do have Charlie Cadlett. Charlie, you should be able to speak. Charlie. Speaking as a taxpayer, I would strongly urge that you take no further action other than to reject 
Mr. Ballot's complaint. It's a waste of our resources. His complaint has no merit. Jim's analysis was exactly correct. The open meeting law does not require summary to be any kind of specific time or place or extent. Mr. Ballard has filed somewhere around the neighborhood of 40 open meeting law complaints. He's not affected by any of this. He's not even a resident of Acton. So I would urge you to not vote to have Lisa spend any more or anybody else to spend any more time on this. You're wasting my money. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, okay, uh, I, 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 David, move the motion to simply you, second the motion. You, you made the motion, I second it. Okay. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Okay. And David, if you'd, if you'd vote, please, if you'd call the roll, please. Yes, Mr. Snyder, can I ask? Yeah, I'm torn on this one. I'll abstain. Uh, Ms. Gardner? Aye. Mr. Charter? I, I'm right with Jim. I'll abstain. Mr. Benson? Aye. And I will vote aye. So, the, uh, Mr. Chair, that's uh, three ayes, no nays, two abstentions. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just Charlie, briefly, you, you, we have an obligation to take action on the complaint or else it's going to wind up going further into the system where we will incur um, legal fees, you know, arguing about it. This seems to be the most sensible, practical way to deal with it. Okay. A uh, point of order, Mr. Chair, were we going to offer Ms. Fredericks a chance to speak on the if she wants 30 seconds, yes. Or you are allowed to speak. Hi, this is Tara from West Jackson. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I, I oppose the idea that this is a new parcel, a new piece of land, as the applicant said. Out of respect for nature and First Nations, these parcels are not new. I also object, I wanted the opportunity to talk about Mr. Birolami building buildings on the wrong place. Uh, specifically prohibited spaces, and he built them, he gets away with it. And I don't like it, and I know that wasn't the application that was at Forest, but I had I wanted the opportunity to speak about it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, and, um, our next item... Mr. Chair, one other person has their hand up. I don't know why. Matt, um, Dan, this is your... David, if you would refrain. Okay. It's, it's, it's Matt's Matt Murphy's job is the facilitator, not you. Okay. Barry Rosen is permitted to speak. Barry? Good evening. Uh, <laughs> I tried to have my hand up, but uh, this gets back to the, um, the class two auto dealer license. And it was a public hearing. And Unless I <laughs> nodded off, which I don't think I did, I don't think the public had an opportunity to speak. It was strictly among the select uh, board members, and I don't think that was a kosher hearing. Uh, and and I, I did have something to say, and, and I don't know who else did, but it, it was, I, I'm, sh I'm not looking at it as a willful thing, but I think it was an error on the part of you gentle persons. Uh, not allowing the public to speak at a public hearing. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I think you need to reopen that public hearing if there were people who want to speak at it uh, and have the applicants present. I, I don't think that was an okay hearing, guys. Oh, and late. I'm sorry, Joan, I apologize. <laughs> I use guys in the generic sense, honestly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Okay, our, our next item is a review of the draft governance agreement for regional emergency communication center uh, with Congress. Uh, John? Thank you. Uh, so the, I, 
the team, the team is here with me. Uh, Chief Burns, Chief Fire, I think just had to step up. Uh, Chief O'Connor, Chief Judge from Concord, uh, and Stephen Gray. Stephen Crane, the town manager from Concord. So uh, we met with this board a few times earlier this year to talk about a project that we were working on uh, to see if we could combine our dispatch services between Concord and Acton. Uh, we received a grant from the Community Compact Program for $150,000 to do a feasibility study. The Collins Center did the feasibility. We presented it to this board um, with the same um, team, and we got some pretty good feedback from uh, both the boards and residents about uh, questions that people had, and, and we worked out those questions, and I think we've been um, advancing the effort. Uh, the next stage of the process was to apply for another grant uh, to help with the startup and transitional costs, and that was a $2 million grant that we applied for in, um, I think, at the beginning of this month, at the beginning of April, it's, and it, we're expected to hear from them uh, within the next six weeks or so. One of the conditions of this uh, startup grant was that a governance agreement between the two communities be established, um, and the reason for that is, is they don't want to consider investing hundreds of thousands, or in this case, millions of dollars in a project, unless they know that they're dealing with two willing parties. Uh, so um, the feedback we received uh, from this board at the, the first few times was, yes, move forward. Um, and we're at the point now where we want to uh, submit a, a governance agreement uh, to the state for them to review. The, the governance agreement is signed by both town managers, uh, but uh, like it, it needs to be approved by the board of selectmen, if, if, or the select board rather. And so it was provided to you last week. It's something that we've been working on for uh, several weeks. Uh, town council has reviewed it and provided comments. Finance department has reviewed it and provided comments. Uh, it was sent to you through email and it was actually added to the packet today. It's not an expectation that you would approve such a document tonight in one shot, although we appreciate it. Um, uh, we are planning to come back next week, uh, if, if, if the chair is okay with that, to give, to give another opportunity for you to review if there's any questions that come up tonight. But basically the structure of the agreement is laid out in the 13-page um, governance agreement. And uh, the thing that, there's a lot in here, but the thing that I, the most important thing I want to communicate to all of you is that right now, um, you, you hired me to oversee town operations one of those operations is dispatch. And so I oversee dispatch. Uh, the chiefs help do that, and they're directly responsible for it, and they, and they report to me, and I report to you. Uh, the structure that we're proposing is very similar, or, or actually identical, um, except that I'll be sharing the work with uh, my fellow town manager uh, in Concord, Stephen Crane, uh, and we'll be working together to oversee a uh, combined department through a board of directors structure and we will be making decisions like we do every year with the budget. You know, we'll be recommending um, X dollars to, for dispatch services, and we'll go to the select board and the finance committee, and, and it'll be considered. And then we'll use that to run this dispatch operation. The difference will be it'll be set up with a, a creative and an innovative uh, combined program that uses the best talents of two organizations um, and and also fosters a lot of communication and collaboration amongst the, the public safety agencies. The fire and police departments already work together on a regular basis. This would just be sort of cementing that uh, partnership. So uh, the, the agreement lays out that there's a board of directors and that we have the same sort of level of oversight of dispatch as we do now. There's a group called the Operations Committee, which is just, just a fancy way of saying the police chief, fire chiefs. Uh, those are the people that are on the operations committee. And just like today, they'll be overseeing the operations of the dispatch center. Uh, it's just called an operations committee instead of what it's called now. Other key terms in the uh, agreement um, are related to staffing. So as a city and alone district, this, this wouldn't have a full staff. It wouldn't have human resources. It wouldn't have finance. It wouldn't have all those things that are part of the overhead of running an organization. And so what we would do is we would uh, contract either with Acton or Concord to fulfill all of those services. So the same way that um, as a dispatch center may be set up in our current public safety facility, it would be subject to the lease. And any services that we provide otherwise, or that Concord provides otherwise, whether it's treasury, finance, IT, would be um, 
to deliver through a contractual arrangement. Um, some of the, one of the things that we need to still work out, or two things rather, um, are the, is the retirement system and the health insurance. Uh, I mentioned in our last meeting, and I think union leadership was at our last meeting, and they may be here again tonight, uh, we need to bargain with the employees that are both enacted and conquered uh, a new contract um, to to allow you know to uh, to show how their working conditions and we're working in the way and starting that process. Uh, we've scheduled a few meetings and, and um, we hope to do that this summer if this advances. So and we've already reached out to Middlesex Retirement to see if they allow us to transition this district to being uh, participants in that system. And we have a, uh, an appointment with the HIT next week to ask them, the HIT being the Health Insurance Trust, to ask them whether they would be okay with adding a few extra people uh, from this district to that program. So those things would work out uh, among many other things if we're successful in getting this $2 million grant. And those will be worked out over the next six months or so. And I think we'd be targeting um, a transition sometime next year or, or whenever it comes together to do the to do the total um, consolidation of the district. So that's my high level overview. I hope you had a chance to look at some of the language in the reference agreement. And uh, actually, before I ask for comments or questions, I would love for our uh, police chief uh, to just uh, provide any input on on the, where we are in the process. Of course, the chief. Good evening. Uh, thanks for allowing me to be here. Um, I want to say that um, I, I see this as a great opportunity uh, for two high-performing dispatch centers, police departments, and fire departments to combine um, to, to, to leverage the ability to be able to ramp up incidents quickly and be able to respond effectively. Um, Chief Judge, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you could recap what you mentioned at the earlier meeting as far as that 10-minute window for the fire department, I think that would be a great example of of one of the benefits of, of regionalizing. Sure. Thank you, Captain, too. Um, in, in the, at the Concord Select Board meeting today, I just used the example of um, one of the primary reasons that I support this, and it really comes down to, for me, the first 10 minutes of a major incident. When we go to a, when we go to a building fire, whether it be Concord or Acton, that's a, and I'll use that, I'll use a building fire as the example. That's, that's a low frequency but high risk event for us. And in the, in the first 10 minutes, things are happening extremely quickly. And there is a lot to do for that one or two dispatchers that are working in the center. And any time that we could that we could have you know three or possibly four people working in there, then we're going to be able to leverage their you know just their, their availability and their ability to respond. Um, the example I used this morning, uh, earlier today was um, the first fire company arrives and the officer realizes immediately that he or she needs more help, and they strike a second alarm. And everybody, you know, hears, you know, second alarm, third alarm, and, and really all that means is we're calling for more help. But when they say a second alarm in Concord, that's going to immediately trigger the movement of 14 pieces of fire apparatus. Five of them are Concord. Nine of them are from other towns. In addition to that, the dispatcher is responsible for moving law enforcement units, utilities, and then every other call that they're receiving about this incident, and then hopefully not another incident on top of it. So I look at the ability to have you know several people sitting in the same room working this incident as a, it, it's, I mean, it improves public safety, it improves firefighter safety, it improves law enforcement safety, because while all of this is going on, we now have, you know, much more ability. We have the potential for one person, one of those dispatchers, to be dedicated to and focus on the radio traffic for that incident. Because when things are when things are happening on the fire ground, they're happening quickly. And one of the things that we rely heavily on is someone in that controlled environment of a dispatch center being able to be an extra set of ears for us to hear the things that we may miss. And frankly, it's, it's, I mean, I'll go back to how I started. It's all about the first 10 minutes because after, after that, I mean, in general, things settle down. Um, the apparatus is moving, you know, 
uh, all the pieces are all the pieces are coming together. But it's that initial it's that initial period when when we really need the the focused attention, and you know not not an hour later when we can hopefully call somebody in. Um, I just think that I think that this um, this is something that really fills that gap. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you. And Chief Hart um, is very supportive of this effort too. He had a conflict tonight, um, but he wanted to make sure that his actually particular uh, comment was about surge events and and being able to have better preparation and more staffing for surge events. Um, if I could also call on my colleague Stephen Crane to, to help me explain how the costs will be shared between the two communities. Yes, sure. Um, Good evening, um, members of the select board, uh, chiefs and John and Jermaine Girardi. Nice to see you. Uh, so I guess it, you know I, I think I mentioned last time we uh, we were here um, in, at a previous stop. I was on the board of directors for the Western Massachusetts Emerging Communication Center. In fact, I was deeply involved in helping that get established, and so I have some familiarity with the process and and of regionalization and. Um, Many of the issues that we're trying to sort through today, we, I, I was a part of sorting through with uh, a dispatch center with two very different communities, Longmeadow, which is a suburban community like Akron and Concord, and the city of Chicopee, which is much more of an urban environment. And I think one of the things that really that, that made it compelling for those two communities to sort out the, the very different ways that they had operated before regionalizing was the level of investment that this Commonwealth is making in regional dispatch centers. Um, I think I've, I, I think this may have been mentioned before, but if you need if you need capital improvements for your dispatch center and you are a standalone, then the Commonwealth will no longer subsidize those. So there's a capital component that is a benefit. And then if and then there are um, right now each dispatch, most police departments and dispatch center and dispatches, uh, you know dispatch dispatch groups receive support incentive grants from the state. Um, the incentive rate though for a regional dispatch center is much greater and a much higher amount um, than you would receive as a standalone. And the funds that, that provide these subsidies are cell phone surcharges. So it is a revenue stream that is very solid um, that you know, you're, not, you're not fighting in the annual budget process at the state legislature. It, it, it is money that is as solid as any money from the state can possibly be. And they are surcharges specified for this purpose. Um, and I think, the, and I know the reason why they do that is because, um, you know, I, it makes it attractive for other communities to regionalize as well. And I think that that's, which, which and, and there are times where if you have more communities enter, it can be more favorable for all the communities that are participating. Um, I, mean, that's, I, I think even if, you know, the plan, or at least as I view it, is for Acton and Concord to establish the best Acton Concord dispatch center we possibly can. And that will be um, incentivized by the state and I think will achieve meaningful cost savings for both communities. Uh, the benefit that we have is that our operations are very similar and I think budgeted very similarly and staffed very similarly. So the kind of the fair formula will be, it's pretty easy to figure out as you, as you saw in the draft district agreement. There's a lot of parity, which makes this arrangement, I think, work very well and uh, makes the incentives in the state uh, a mutual benefit. Thank you, Steve. John? Thank you. Uh, no, just uh, if there are questions or comments about the, the agreement and um, anything else about the project. Questions or comments from board members? David? Uh, y yes. Um, uh, just a clarification, uh, uh, General Majority. The board of directors consists of both town managers. Are there others? Uh, no. Uh, the way this is structured, it's it's just sort of it's it's meant to it's meant to uh, mirror the role that we serve now. Uh, right now, we kind of do this, and since we're joined together, we both want to have an opportunity to do it together and share that responsibility equally. Good, great. I, that's the way I read the agreement. I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly. Um, the, my next question is um, uh, something I asked a, a variation on last time, but, but I just wanted to a, a, a ask a little, a little differently. If, if there's an incident uh, near one of the town lines where um, the other town could respond more quickly, 
um, is the town that it's in always called first, or is, does the other town get called? So if it's, um, you know, uh, on the border between Acton and, and, and Concord, and it's actually closer to a firehouse in Concord, but it's in Acton, right? Or vice versa, it's close to, you know, it's actually in Concord, but closer to a firehouse in, in Acton. Um, is, is that, uh, is the other town ever called first? Chief. Uh, David, I see us responding and dispatching uh, very similar to the way we do today. The difference is if it's near the Concord line and we need and we're tied up and we need to check if Concord's available, instead of picking up that phone and dialing it, we can just we, we know who's we're aware we have situational awareness of what's going on between the two communities. So that interaction would actually be enhanced. Right. And we share um, the largest thoroughfare in Acton goes to go route two goes into Concord. And I think our second busiest road, Great Road, goes into Concord. And if we look at the map, I didn't measure it, but it looks like our largest border is with Concord. Great. Yeah, thank you. I, I understand. And 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 one final thing just to um, uh, ask a follow up question to what uh, Chief Judge said. I, I, um, and this is just uh, not so connect, uh, connected to the agreement, just an understanding on my part. Is, is the dispatcher able to monitor um, communication at an in, at a site at an incident, um, you know, between firefighters, for example? Does the can the dispatcher hear all that, or is that there are two kind of separate channels between the firefighters on a site or officers at a site and and, um, and dispatch? Well, they can they can monitor all of the radio traffic, um, and I think the point I was trying to make, probably not clearly enough. Is that if they're if they're occupied trying to get all of that other apparatus moving from Sudbury and Maynard and Acton, um, and they have to deal with the police on another frequency and they're receiving phone calls, then it, it takes them away from being able to kind of focus on that on that fire ground. So having the additional people right on hand, um, I foresee a situation where they could then, uh, you know, one person could be dedicated to that that task. Thank you. That's all for me, John. Okay. Uh, further comments from board members? Uh, Dean. Yeah, just, just a comment to uh, both managers. Uh, you know, this has been a really busy year, and thank you for all your work on keeping this thing going. Um, it's a tremendous piece of work. I'm still pouring through it, but uh, you have to be commended for taking this on, so thank you. Thanks, Dean. So, uh, Jim, um, yeah, I echo, echo Dean about the, you know, the immense challenge of the work, and, and I know there's a lot more ahead. A lot of the issues that got raised last time were really issues that will end up being settled in negotiations with unions. Um, so, uh, you know, best of luck with that, too, and, and you know, uh, addressing the concerns of, of, the, of the employees. Um, I, we did get one specific question from a resident. I just wanted to make sure it got said out loud and get, get a response, which was uh, that, the, that the direct call number, uh, you know, like our 978-263-2911 that goes right to the Acton Police Department, that would still go to this regional dispatch center. Am I, am I correct in that assumption? Okay. I, I see yes. Chief Burroughs nodding his head, so I'm reassured. Thank you. So, um, so uh, John and Stephen, you need approval of of this governance agreement from uh, your respective boards, and the the grant application with this agreement draft agreement needs to be signed needs to be filed by May thirty first. Well, the, the, we already filed the application, but one of the conditions of the the application was we have a signed governance agreement. Uh, before they finished reviewing. And so they, they reached out to us a few weeks ago and said, hey, we need that by May 31st. Um, so that's um, that's why we're, um, we, we're able to finalize it and get it before you draft form. And if there's any comments or feedback, we can make adjustments or, or we can uh, we can move forward after tonight if, if you're comfortable. Hi, Jim. Um, I, I would like to see a resolution of 
of the issue about the Middlesex County Retirement Board or removing it from the, the contract. But having it right now, the state of it is that it's left in, you know, in red with a question mark. So it seems like that should be resolved or removed before we would agree to the contract. Doc, may I touch on that? Yeah, just so I think, um, I see John Mandurai, but thank you, uh, Mr. Benson. Um, I, uh, so one of the things that, that we, we wanted to put in there that it would be clear um, for the pension system, because that, wrote, that, that is a financial impact of the community um, with regards to OPEB. Um, the, the district would have the OPEB liability, not the community. That's one of the things that we talked about in Concord. It's, there's an OPEB liability that will be with the district now, like you have an OPEB liability with Act of Marshboro. Um, but this is an existing OPEB liability that just gets transferred into the district. It's not a new one that's created. Um, in with Westcom, we did the same thing. We wanted to be a part of Hamden County Retirement Board, so the employees would still have the same pension benefits. And that ended up requiring a special act. And I haven't gotten into whether or not that was unique to Hamden County or the Middlesex County would, would have a would also require special legislation. Um, the retirement board uh, was supportive, and as John said, he's got an appointment to kind of. We're working on to get in touch with them, but the timeline of this, which you know, if I was if I was the in charge of all of, of everything, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have the timeline set up this way. But this is the way it is in the state. It just doesn't allow for us to kind of drill down into that. But um, you know, I think that 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 really we want to declare our intent that that's what we want to do and, and go through and have a note in there about what it may take to do that. Does that make sense to you, Jim? Um, if I could say it back to make sure I got it, it sounds like the, what the what the contract should read, if we're going to agree to it soon, is to express our strong mutual intent to uh, to use the Middlesex County Retirement Board and to work with them to help make that possible without promising it, because you know the Middlesex County Retirement Board is us and we don't get to decide what they do. Yeah, I mean we we could we could make that change. We could also say that. You know that will make sure that they are just part of a retirement system, and with our goal being middle sex. Um, either way, that the intent is just to make sure that we protect the, the employees' ability to have a pension that they're uh, we'll promise. And, and how about with the health insurance trust? So, I think that is another thing that I don't know that we need to sort out for this agreement to be finalized. I think we will be providing benefits to the employees in one way or another. Um, so the health insurance trust seems to be the easiest way, but I think we need to hear from them to make sure they agree with that. Um, so that's kind of why I think I'm going to them on the 25th or sometime next week. So we should have that answer before the end of the month. Well, um, we were due to meet again on next Monday. Would you be able to have, would you be able to have this, uh, a further draft uh, to us so we'd be in a position to vote on it. The following Monday is Memorial Day now. Yeah, we can, we can have a draft, a revised draft that addresses those two points uh, in whatever way we feel most comfortable putting in writing uh, for you for your Monday meeting, the 24th. Does that make sense to the board members? Thumbs up? Okay. All right, so um, we'll add that to the agenda for next next Monday night. Thank you. Jim. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting with um, Mr. Rosen's comments about the, uh, the auto dealer hearing, not here, not um, having a public comment period. Um, it disturbs me. I'm not sure what to make of that. Uh, one possibility would be to have um, maybe the, the manager consult with town council about the legalities here and what we can do. Why, why don't, why don't, is Mr. Rosen still here? Is he in the audience? Um, I can check. He no, doesn't hear me. Yes. Um, why don't we do this? Why don't we take Barry's comment? We heard Tara's comment and, um, we could do it right now. And if, if we decide that his comments might change our vote, you know, we could reopen the hearing next week. Well, can we can we finalize with the chiefs and the okay. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Okay. 
Okay, I thought we did. Okay, so what we'll what we're doing is we're uh, John will send us out for next Monday's meeting a revised um, draft of the governance agreement with the several suggestions that came out of tonight. And um, we will further discuss and, and hopefully be able to be in a position to vote on the, uh, the, um, the, the agreement. Make sense? Thank you for your time. And thank you, uh, Chief and Chief and Chief. And Mr. Mr. Chair, there is a request for public comment on this item, if you are taking it at this time. All right. Is there public? Would there be any public comment? Yes. Okay, Tara, you should be able to speak. Hi, this is Tara from West Austin, and um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So last time we um, heard similar speech about this, um, it was said that the concerns had been addressed um, by. You know, the, the union's concerns had been addressed. And then when the union leaders came on, they said that, no, their concerns were not addressed. So um, that's, I'd like very much to know what the union leaders think. I also feel like this agreement looks very serious. Is it binding? Hey, John? It, it's, a, it's a formal commitment that the two parties want to work together on the regional district. Uh, there are uh, several opportunities for either community to uh, change their mind, but I think the intent here is that we want to do this and that we want to leverage this substantial investment from the state and this uh, significant opportunity to collaborate with a, a very professional uh, uh, peer of ours and, and provide better services to both of our communities. And so when is, the, is this a town meeting vote coming up? When, when is the opportunity for the, the voters to have some you know, to participate in this. It seems like a pretty significant change to the way that um, leasing is conducted and acted. We feel strongly, and I guess I would defer to the Chief, that this 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 implementation of the regional dispatch district is not going to change how we police in the community. It's just going to make it more cost effective and provide more opportunities for um, advancement, uh, for professional career advancement for dispatch staff and uh, more equipment and uh, better resources for both communities. I have two more questions. Is that okay, no. Chairman? Go ahead. So the first question is that, well, it's actually a comment. It seems like that it would create layers of bureaucracy to remote, further remove um, operations from the voters, uh, that there would be need more direct control over the budget, or are you saying that the budget would still be controlled um, and and, and how would complaints to dispatch be handled? You know, complaints about the dispatch operation be handled. Would that be a board of selectmen function? Or would that now be part of a regional group that has a regional board of directors and a regional bureaucracy that would be separate from the board from the select board? Um, there's no additional bureaucracy. Um, the town manager in each community uh, that's in this district will provide leadership over the operations in the same way that it does now. We'll just have uh, an opportunity to collaborate and do it so. And then the last question is regarding the technology, because um, we've heard that uh, there's a lot of technology, the updated technology that connects in with the national, federal databases and all of this kind of stuff that wasn't being done before when we did the um, due process for immigrants. Some people call that sanctuary town work. There was a guarantee that there was not uh, a ready sharing of information about immigrants and other people who didn't give permission to uh, share information outside of the town. Um, and so uh, is that upgrade in technology also mean sending information to the cloud into the federal databases? I, I was at one of meeting in um, the police station and found all this FBI training uh, material there and thought that was really concerning. So I'm concerned about that. Um, too, and I'd like, I feel like it's going to really fast. That's what I feel like. This is going very fast, and the agreement seems very thick and official that it's not going to be easy to get out of. Once we spend one dollar of that uh, money, then we're basically controlled by the state agency that decides what happens to uh, towns that, that spend that money and what happens to towns that don't want to do what they say they're going to do and do have to give that money back, that kind of thing. Hi, Chief. There's no plans to change any 
sharing technologies that, that we're doing today. The plan is to maintain similar, similar operations we do now. The opportunity exists to purchase maybe some new equipment to make the operations we're doing today more effective and efficient. Uh, Stephen? Yeah, it's just a, just a comment on that. I, 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 I can tell you from direct experience that uh, the state does incentivize the regionalization as a, uh, as a policy priority, but they are not involved in the operation of the regional dispatch center. Um, the Commonwealth, if the Commonwealth wanted to take over dispatch, you know, and establish its own regional dispatch and keep that cell phone surcharge money for itself, they could do it tomorrow um, through the state police. They, they have elected over the years not to do that, which is why the, um, the law was changed to make it uh, more inviting for local um, departments to join together to regionalize. And so while the state doesn't, while the state does bind you to certain terms and conditions of the grant, the decisions about how um, dispatch operations are managed in the, in the rec itself are determined 100% locally. Are there any further comments from the public comments? Uh, Mr. Rosen has his hand up. I'm not sure if it's related to this issue or the next. Um, uh, Barry. It's related to this issue. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. My question, uh, I'm speaking as a private citizen. Uh, our, our, uh, our accountant for our board uh, indicated to us very strongly that it was her professional opinion that in the future Middlesex was going to have to make a major adjustment uh, to get the funding to where it has to be. As it was her opinion, they have been undercharging all the municipalities belonging to the organization. Therefore, my question is, should this happen? She didn't indicate when, it was her opinion. Should this happen, how would that impact us? Because I don't know how underfunded Concord is. I don't know how underfunded Acton is. But presumably, if they said, okay, guys, this is makeup time, how do we handle that? Are we 50-50 are we in the new pool, or is it you're shifted one way or the other? Thank you. So the people that retired from Acton as dispatchers are going to be Acton dispatcher retirees, whatever Middlesex decides they want to do. And Concord has its own retirement system, and the same happened for those that have already retired. The existing employees that go to the new district, um, we're going to sort out exactly how that cost sharing goes forward. But I would expect it would be the Concord ones. Uh, covered by Concord and the acting ones are covered by Acton and then any new people that we hire after the district is established will split 50 50 is uh how uh, I would see this happening uh, but Stephen if you wanted to clarify anything I may have missed Stephen no I think that that's it wouldn't change current retirees at all I think it would be um what he says independent district uh, it would be starting from like a new entry into the districts and um you know there, there are like i said it's there are ways to do it there may um you know the assessment the retirement board will figure out what's a proper assessment um and then um the way i look at it is with the incentive that we would get from the state to do this um you would the, each town would have the opportunity to perhaps apply some of that incentive to offset uh, you know, OPEB contributions or increased pension liability. Thank you. Thank uh, on, yeah, uh, on, you know, through the assessment. Yeah, I, I understand. Thank you very much. I was just a little concerned when I heard her presentation to us about how this mixing and matching might take place in the future. And I want to make sure that you, you, you all considered it and figured out uh, before we come together, figure out how we'll handle this. If she's correct in that, there'll be a reckoning at some point she thought in the near future. Thank you very much. Barry, just stick around for a, for a bit. Okay, John, I'll do that. Okay. Um, so getting back to Jim's comment, uh, the suggestion I had um, is 
we could take Barry's comment of what he now what he would have said if I didn't err and uh, uh, and I had, had public comment and um, if his comment and Tara's comments would cause anybody to change their vote um, we could uh, reopen the public hearing at our next meeting or on uh, so Barry, if you if you offer your, your the comment you would have made during the public hearing, we just say goodbye to the chiefs. Bye. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> am I am I still on? I don't yes, you are. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought it was pack muted. Okay. I'm, I wasn't looking to change anybody's mind, John, or. Select board. I'll get used to select board soon. It takes me a while. Um, I wasn't looking to change anything, and, and I don't know how many people would have been in the queue, which is part of my concern. Uh, I, I did hear Tara uh, speak briefly. My concern was knowing the landlord <laughs> uh, a little bit. Uh, my concern was on whether uh, the uh, the applicant and or the landlord was going to uh, take the opportunity to assure that chapter X of our bylaws, specifically discharging to the MS4, was going to be, they'd work on some sort of amelioration. New car areas, not only do they do service, but they do car washing. You may know that the RAC recommended and the board approved, for example, to stop car washes at AB unless they did it on a special area where it didn't run into the recharge system of the town. Called the MS4, sorry. It's, it's, it's a techie weenie term, guys, don't worry about it. Um, it's the, re, it's the, uh, it's the rainwater, essentially liquid, uh, recharge system, uh, a sewage system for for uh, other than sewage water. So uh, we have we the town has had to cite some businesses along the way for doing this. Uh, I wanted to assure, and it's not an easy thing to do because it means you got to put in drain. Yes, you got to keep runoff going from your drive, your impervious area into the street. I wanted to get this out in the open ahead of time so that the work the RAC had done over the years uh, for writing Chapter U and the bylaws and regulations that came out of our engineering group and Selby and others would be taken up with the applicant and or the, and or the landlord. That was the nature of why I, I wanted to speak to you gentle persons. Not to change your vote, to get that in the open, people. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Barry. You're welcome. So with that said, are we comfortable with the decision that we made? Jim? David? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the Barry's concern can be addressed by, you know, John's now heard it, and we can pass it on to staff to make sure that, um, you know, stormwater issues are, are addressed during the, during the rest of the permitting process. Um, yeah, I'm fine. Okay. All right. Um, and then John on, on the, on the prior item, the governance agreement, you'll get the, the further draft out to us and it will be on the agenda for next Monday night. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. So, um, Item eight would be presentation of a feasibility study for the new Department of Public Works facility. John, <laughs> thank you. I, I would have asked Matt Murphy to help me bring some folks in. Um, John, um, Corey, who we bring in? Sorry, um, Michael Richards and uh, John Comu. Okay, thanks. So um, work has been underway and thought has been 
advanced about the needs of our public works facility and transfer station. It's a building that has reached its useful life. Um, if you've driven through, you've driven by it, you'll know what I mean by that. Uh, we, we have been working uh, on what, you know, what it looks like next. And then last year, the board was selected, it was the board selected at the time, um, did its goal setting and prioritized uh, moving forward with uh, what to do about the public works facilities as one of the top goals. Uh, so we really accelerated the work on this uh, and worked with Russ and Samson, uh, who, who's here with us tonight, to do a feasibility study. The feasibility study uh, was a pretty detailed report, if you had a chance to go through it, um, but that's why we have the experts here to uh, walk us through it. And this is just the beginning of the process. Uh, once we have understood the needs of the facility and what could go there, and then the next discussion is what, what should go there and what the board supports uh, happening there. So this is the first step in that. And uh, thank you, John and, and Mike and Corey uh, for this presentation. Great. Gentlemen, proceed. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. And hear my voice? Good. Yes. Um, thank you for inviting us here. My name is uh, John Como. I'm here with Mike Richard. We're from Weston and Sampson, and the town has hired us to perform a feasibility study to look at the existing Department of Public Works facility and operations and the transfer station and recycling facility um, operations. Uh, we delivered a draft report on Friday, and um, we're here to give you an update on where things stand. I'll talk about the DPW facility, and then Mike Richards will talk about the uh, transfer stations. Um, quick agenda, we'll try to keep it to uh, under 15 minutes. We know time, time is, uh, is valuable. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the Public Works Department responsibilities, give you an update on the study, um, and what we've come up with so far for proposed costs and then have some, leave some time for questions. Um, Town's Public Works uh, Department has a highway division, engineering division, trees and grounds, public facilities, administration, and the transfer station, the recycling station. Um, the DPW in town touches the lives of residents every day by maintaining the infrastructure that the community relies on. Um, touch on a few things. They do so many things um, every day, but they maintain all the town's 95 miles of roads, uh, the sidewalks and the parking lots, uh, take care uh, and preserve the town's trees along town-owned roadways. Uh, the transfer station is responsible for managing, collecting, and transferring town's recyclables and delivering them to off-site facilities, and that includes hazardous waste. Um, the DPW is the town's first responder. They uh, are on call 24 hours a day, and what they do allows other first responders in town to do their jobs. So they are on the roads in the event of emergency, making it safe for others to do their jobs. Um, what they do also enhances the quality of life for Acton's residents and increases safety. Why does the town need a new facility? Um, we went out and did a, an assessment of the, the facility. I have to say that uh, Corey and his, his, his crew do an amazing job of maintaining this building and the, the other buildings on the site. But the building was built in 1970. Um, it's, it's at the end of its useful life. Um, there's structural problems with it. There are uh, code issues with it. Ventilation is, is poor, lighting is poor, uh, space is inadequate for a modern DPW operation, especially when moving forward uh, into the next 50 years. Um, it no longer really serves the need of the town. It doesn't protect the town's investment in their uh, vehicle fleet and equipment fleet properly. Um, the town has millions of dollars invested in, in their equipment. The, facility can't adequately store everything properly inside. That also has an impact on operations and employee safety. 
uh, some quick examples of, of what we found. Um, the single white, uh, single thickness CMU block wall, which is unreinforced, is, is essentially failing. It it's, has water damage, um, structural deficiencies. There is damage caused by vehicles hitting the block wall from the interior. The vehicles are too big for the vehicle storage garage. And they have to park so close to the wall that they occasionally will, will bump in and, and dislodge uh, some of uh, the wall itself. Um, there's step cracking, structural failure on the center bearing CME wall that runs down the length of the building. Uh, there's a picture of the vehicle storage garage, very neat, kept, kept up very well, but very small. Vehicles are parked in the center aisle, which requires a lot of jostling and maneuvering to get certain vehicles in and out of the garage. It also does duty as uh, storage. So it's small to begin with, and then a large percentage is taken up with, with storage. And it's, for example, a photo of a recently constructed vehicle storage garage, better lit, ample space for circulation in, in parking of larger vehicles. There's also a storage missing. Um, the town's uh, the department's employees' support spaces are, just like everything else, small. Everything's very undersized, built for a different era. Uh, not adequately sized to house all the employees for yearly training or even to gather in one place to muster in the morning. Uh, again, very well kept up, but inadequately sized and with inadequate uh, amenities. Um, there's no women's locker room. Uh, handicapped accessibility is, is lacking throughout the, the building. Uh, vehicle maintenance areas, uh, again, poorly ventilated, poorly lit, undersized, uh, very cramped and dangerous. Um, OSHA clearance is around. Uh, dangerous equipment is lacking. Uh, there's no automatic toxic gas removal uh, or nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide. So what is proposed? Um, we met with Corey, we met with his staff, we interviewed each of the departments individually and I gathered all the information that we needed to understand um, Acton's specific needs, which are different from any other jobs. Um, with the moving of engineering staff and some public facility staff to the department, there will be about 40 employees located at Forest Road. Um, there's a fleet of 48 large, small vehicles and equipment, uh, 28 towable trailers. Um, we discovered or determined that we would need 25 lockers, uh, muster room for 34, and parking for 40. For that information, we, we went back and we developed space needs sheets and room data sheets, we call them. And what that does is it's kind of put a physical parameters around each of the space, the size, and then the requirements for mechanical, electrical, or other systems in the space. Um, example, men's locker room is 780 square feet, mustard training room is 676 square feet that will accommodate 35 employees, and a vehicle storage garage is 25,000 square feet. Now, to give you an example, um, the existing facility itself, the entire footprint is 19,200 square feet currently. So vehicle storage is larger than the entire uh, building itself as, as it stands now. Um, we put together a space needs matrix where we gathered all the square footages for all the spaces that we determined. We then came up with the all-in number of 52,000. That's, that's the Cadillac. We then went back and met with Corey and his staff, and we adjusted those numbers to find efficiencies. Where could we double up on a conference room? Where could we reduce size in a, in a vehicle maintenance area without affecting operations and, and ongoing um, maintenance activities? And at that first go, after that first go around, we ended up at um, 47,000 square feet. That's a, a reduction of about nine and a half percent from the original. Um, we still feel that there is an opportunity to find more savings and more spaces, money. We can come up with uh, additional space savings. We can we can come up with additional cost savings. 
um, from the room data sheets, we came up with block plans and assembled them um, on the site as, as concept plans. The Forest Road DPW site is, it, is the capped landfill. It's the transfer station. The total property is about 24 acres, but the usable acreage for practically usable acreage for the DPW is really only seven to eight um, acres. And a lot of that is also limited by setbacks, by um, some wetlands and, it's, and some uh, topography that's challenging. Um, one of the goals would be to uh, mitigate the impact of any new construction on the Forest Road neighborhood. The, the red line is, is a 30-foot um, setback by, by zoning. We would try to maintain a 100-foot setback um, to kind of buffer the, the um, visually and acoustically the site from the neighborhood. So we came up with a number of, of different schemes that looked at different arrangements of, of how to organize the site. And, and we came up with a um, preferred alternative scheme. Um, and I'll give you some of the highlights of that. that we maintain the 100 foot uh, vegetative buffer between the DPW site and Forest Road. The storage garage was placed also to enhance that buffer um, to block visually and acoustically the interior kind of DPW yard operations from the neighborhood. We located the fuel island, which is currently centrally located on the site, and right in the middle of kind of hectic DPW operations, new trucks moving, uh, front end motors moving, you got school buses coming in, uh, police cars coming in. We'd like to move that closer to Forest Road. What that allows uh, the town vehicles to do is to fuel without entering the DPW site. Um, keep the, the salt shed, it's brand, practically brand new, it's 10 years old, in fantastic condition. We would uh, propose adding additional canopy storage to the north. Um, the plan maintains counterclockwise circulation around the site, which is ideal for large vehicles for safety purposes. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Richard. He's going to talk about the transfer station and recycling. Thank you, John. Thank you, board members. John, you want to take me to the next slide? So the approach we take to the transfer station and recycling facility is, is very similar to that of uh, uh, the DPW operations. We listen to the staff. We observe the operations. In this case, that includes site walk as well as drone footage. Um, and we reviewed records, Re records being existing permits in place, tonnages, sticker sales, things of that nature. Next slide. Some things that we took away from the facility, uh, some positive things. Um, first and foremost, it's located above the landfill. It is a hindrance in some aspects, but we view this as a positive because you're taking an otherwise futile piece of land and you turn it into something beneficial to the town. Um, we think that's a good thing. You have counterclockwise traffic flow patterns. Uh, this is encouraged from a safety perspective. You have a long traffic queue length from the uh, storage, uh, from, I'm sorry, from the gatehouse or the scale house out to Route 2. Um, in the setup that you have, recycling operations come first. And this is a general industry practice put recycling operations first, that helps to encourage or increase recycling. And you have a, your MSW, your refuse handling and transport um, method is via a tipping floor. So in other words, you put the trash on the floor, it gets, once on the floor, uh, a heavy equipment operator will come in and they'll crush it, shred it, and they'll put it in an open top uh, trailer for transport long distance to its ultimate disposal place. And well, you know, years of data uh, monitoring these facilities, we find that that is, the, that is perhaps the most efficient um, density that you'll find in the home. Next slide. With this, we also found some, some key issues. Um, despite your long 
track uh, uh, queuing capacity, um, you do have queuing issues. Um, you also have operations that are spread out over a large area. Uh, the building, the, tri the tipping building, is in need of repair, and your scale house is, a, is outdated for today's today's operations. And I'll talk a little bit more about these in the, in the coming slide. Next, John. Starting with the uh, traffic queuing, uh, what we found is you have you have bottleneck bottlenecking occurring at the recycling center, and the reason this is occurring is is 90% or so of the people coming to this facility are there for two purposes. One, get rid of MSW, and two, to get rid of what we'll call right now primary recyclables. Primary recyclables being uh, your, cook, your, um, your paper and cardboard, as well as your commingles, which is plastics, glass, uh, metal cans. And those four containers are located right after this bend. So you go right past the scale house, you take a 90 degree turn, and that's where the bottleneck happens. In this photo right here, what you're seeing is the first car that you see in that in that line is a, a gray station wagon that's backing up. And what you have is you have all those cars behind them just waiting for that car to back up. Next slide. The next issue that we see is the, the, the site is spread out. Um, we have a staff of three working this facility. That's that's a, that's a fairly good amount. That's that's industry standard is what we'll say. Um, you have one that is pretty much used all the time to move material off site, uh, whether it be recyclables or MSW. Um, they're they're on the road a lot. You have one that's working the facility in the heavy equipment. That he's moving containers. He's moving uh, materials around the site, and that leaves the scale house operator to monitor most of the rest of the site. And the scale house is up at the beginning of the operations. And he, he needs to observe most of these operations most of the time. Not only that, he has to care for the scale house duties, which is answering questions, uh, collecting transactions, and selling stickers. So he's spread pretty thin. And this is important because it is a regulatory matter in that um, the DEP wants these these deposit areas to be monitored, monitored continuously, so we don't want to lose sight of them. Next, and then we have the tipping building, which is in need of repair. You have the insulation that's deteriorated. You have the the metal panels that's aside the the wall panels as well as the roof panels that are damaged and or missing. You have your roll up doors that do not function. Um, this has resulted in an unsecured facility. Not only that, you're leading to wind-blown litter, creating more work for your staff. Um, and you also have rodents and other vectors causing nuisance conditions. Um, and, and essentially leaving, leaving the town with a, a liability that I don't think, I don't think you want. Um, and then you have some other deteriorating metal inside that just could use some cleanup, uh, just tackle longevity. Next slide. So keeping what we found in mind, we developed some goals for our concepts. One, we want to alleviate the bottleneck at the recycling area. Uh, two, we want to relocate that scale house to try to improve observations and share staff. Um, three is we were asked to take a look at different options for MSW handling. As I mentioned earlier, the means that you have right now is what we consider to be the most efficient, but there are other options that we consider, which is stationary compactors as well as trailer compactors. Um, also, whenever we're laying out one of these facilities, we want to try to separate the residential traffic from the operations. We like to have the operations behind the scenes so that you're not intermixing labor, labor force and heavy equipment with the residents. Um, because you're working above a landfill, I mean, well, because the facility is located above a landfill cap, we don't want to disturb that cap. We can, but you might get yourself into an unnecessary cost or unnecessary expense that we'd like to try to avoid, and I think in this case we can. Um, the other thing is you have an operating facility here. You have people that use this facility every day. We want to minimize the disruptions to this facility. We don't want to shut it down for a long period of time if at all, we want to try to avoid that. So, John, next slide. 
so with this, we, we developed a number of options. Uh, we, we felt four were, the, were um, uh, worthy of, of considering for OTA. Um, all these options consider almost the same thing, which is you know, moving those primary recyclables away from that 90 degree bend, keep it more of a linear traffic flow pattern, um, try to get wider bypass lanes so that we're not having that bottlenecking. And we're also trying to take those operations and have the container movement behind the scenes or in the operations area. And in each of these options also, we take the scale house and we move it closer to the operation um, so that we can have shared, shared, shared staff. If you will. And I think that's it for the transfer station component. And John, you want to talk about the uh, anticipated costs? Sure. Thanks, Mike. So um, one thing that would help is to take a look at, at what um, similar DPW facilities have cost um, recently. We've done at Weston and Sampson over 100 uh, Department of Public Works facilities in the last 15 years, and we've kept pretty close tab on, on the costs. Um, so the last these, these uh, facilities represent the last uh, seven or so years. And we've escalated the costs to uh, 2023, as we did with the, the active uh, cost. Um, the range is, you know, high four to, to low 500s typically. And there's reasons why some are higher and some are lower, you know, depending on um, uh, what amenities were, were, were programmed into the facility. For instance, uh, some, some facilities have new salt sheds um, and others don't. Um, in this case, the average cost per square foot was um, $490, escalated to 2023. Um, Acton's uh, DPW cost, um, and construction cost only, is um, $474. That doesn't include soft cost or escalation. Um, so for the construction cost of the DPW alone, $22,800,000 uh, for 48,000 square feet. Um, soft costs typically um, an additional 18 to 24%. We bumped up the escalation um, in all contingencies as high as we could on this because of what's been going on recently with um, construction costs related to COVID and other, other uh, supply line shortages, material shortages. Uh, it's been a little bit crazy the last, uh, last three or four months. But um, that would put the DPW in the total project cost range of 26.9 to 28.2 million. The um, transfer station recycling uh, construction costs we came up 2.6 million. Uh, that's site development costs, repair to the facility, um, and new uh, and new um, uh, tipping. Uh, sorry, scale house. The um, Total together, we're at um, 30 to 32.1 million. That includes um, all contingencies, soft costs um, included. Uh, that concludes our, our update on the feasibility study. And happy to take any questions or hear any comments that people may, might have. Questions or comments from board members? Hey, Jim. Um, well, just uh, we can't afford that <laughs> at its current, um, you know, scale and scope and size and dollars. Um, we're already looking at, um, you know, projects that we want to do that we can't do. And they cost a lot less than that. Um, so I, I think the, the, the manager has, and his staff have a, have a really difficult job ahead of finding what are the pieces of this that are the most important, uh, and getting those done. Um, cause I do recognize that the, especially on the DPW side, it's, uh, it's not, it's not a livable situation for the people that work there. Something has to change. Um, I think that's my main thought. The only the only small thought I had was uh, on the transfer station side. Um, uh, 
there were no interviews of users of the transfer station, and um, their experience and perspective was going to be important before we go ahead with the changes there. But we got time. We got time for that. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dean. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I appreciate what Jim said about, you know, we can't afford it, but, you know, we can never afford it. Uh, we, we couldn't afford the library. We couldn't afford the expansion of the town hall. We couldn't afford the public safety building. This is critical infrastructure. The buildings down there now, it's 50 years old, was actually undersized 50 years ago when people said it's going to be too much money. And now we've got a situation where you've got a 50 year old building, which is, you know, I know it rather intimately from my previous career. Um, it's not in great shape and it's undersized. And, you know, it was designed when Acton had a population about 50% of what we've got right now. It was designed when our street miles were probably 66 or 75 percent of what they are right now. The town has continued to expand. There have been entire departments that were not even conceived of in 1970 that are operating out of there. So, you know, we've kicked the can down the road, and I find found it distressing in my career working to a certain number of years out of that building that it constantly gets put off to the back because, you know, let's face it, it's not a cuddly building, <laughs> not cuddly operations, but these are the kind of things, when you've got a snowstorm, or you've got a hurricane, or you need to get rid of trash, these are the kind of things that you need. And, uh, and I'm, I don't want to raise my taxes more than any other senior citizen in town wants to raise their taxes, but I think it's time that we've got to bite the bullet. Um, yeah, if we can make it cheaper, I'd love to make it cheaper, but um, making it cheaper probably is not a real great option at this point. Um, it's a big nugget that we're going to have to bite off, and uh, and I think that it's time that we put some serious consideration to it. So I'm ready to press ahead. I know that it's uh, not going to be an easy road to, uh, to follow here because of what I've said before. It's not a cuddly building. Nobody likes to think about this kind of stuff, but um, I can tell you from first-hand experience that these are the kind of services that people want, and I've not noticed any decrease in the demand in services. If if anything, there's an increase in the demand for services provided by public works. So I, uh, I'm fully prepared to, uh, to push through push this through as far as some more seed money to go to town meeting in June. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Joan? You, you're muted. I would support renovating the building. Can this feasibility study be broken into different portions? So it doesn't all have to be done at once. But I remember going into that building, Dean, when Florence Ross was in there. <laughs> um, it, it can be faced. Uh, one of the issues that we find when renovating or trying to repurpose a, a building that is of a similar nature to what exists in Acton is it becomes uh, almost structurally infeasible to upgrade because we're going to put other additions onto it which is going to require that there's seismic bracing uh, additional snow loads snow drift loads by the time the, the the structure is upgraded to meet current codes it becomes extremely expensive and you're still left with uh, kind of a substandard space to work with it dictates a lot of things that limit the the operations and limit the functionality of the building it's not insulated right now you know we need to, we need to insulate it um, the roof does have some insulation on it. i don't know how much but um the space would still be um low you know in terms i i could see possibly reusing it just as vehicle storage 
but again, it would require not a lot of, of structural upgrades, and we've done this before. It's almost a wash, and then you're not left you're not left with um, an optimal solution. But it's something we can look into, and, and we, we are looking into it. But it's our, our inclination is to is to not recommend reusing reusing that building. Further comments, David? Yes, um, I, I'm definitely in, in favor of uh, doing something here. I really hate um, managing to a crisis, and I think, you know, the, the these buildings are in uh, in such a condition that they're not going to last forever. And then, you know, if, if there's a crisis, you know, it's, it's just going to. I just, for me, I hate doing that. I'd rather, you know, do a a, a good job uh, uh, correctly. Having said that, I do have a, a few detailed questions on the plan, if that's okay. I have one question on the transfer station and then a handful on the, uh, the DPW building. Um, first, yes. did, did I understand correctly that um, uh, the preferred and most efficient way to handle the, the solid waste is as we do now with a front-end loader pushing into a tra trash compactor? I'm surprised that that is the most efficient way. Yeah, we've been we've been tracking that information for for a, 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 a number of years, and we see marginally better uh, waste densities for hauling using this method uh, as opposed to a trailer compactor. Um, and it is about the way you handle the waste on the floor. I mean, you have to process it on the floor. You have to crush it. You have to shred it. And then put it in 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 the um, in the open top trailer, um, and we see even better results if once in the trailer they're able to compact it a little bit. Okay, thank you. That, that it was just kind of surprising to a uh, someone someone who's uh, not fully informed on these things. And then the um, the, the questions for the DPW uh, building, if I'm understanding the proposal correctly, uh, uh, it's to get rid of all the other buildings on the site except for the salt shed and replace them with one large building. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so, so currently not, not, there's another building, which is a pole barn that sits behind the salt shed. We wouldn't propose removing that. It's an unheated uh, a building. It's built on poles. You know, it doesn't have a foundation. Uh, it's old, but it, it serves a purpose. It, it provides shelter for, for, for equipment that doesn't need heat. Um, so we wouldn't have proposed removing that. The salt shed is in great condition. There is a temporary um, kind of storage arrangement made out of conics boxes and uh, fabric roof structure uh, that houses a lot of equipment signage uh, that can't fit indoors. That would go. That stuff would go inside. The plows now that are sitting around the site would end up going inside. What's nice about um, that is when, when the winter comes, you can hook them up to the, the, to the plow trucks and you can park them in the garage and they're ready to go uh, when a storm event hits. Right now they're sitting outside, they're rusting, the hydraulics are getting damaged um, and they need to be replaced more often than they should. Uh, other vehicles are sitting outside that don't fit it as well. So the department has to pick and choose what they want to protect. The, mo you know, the most valuable equipment goes inside and the other equipment uh, gets relegated to the exterior under some some under canopies, but some exposed to the elements. Um, sure. That's that's really it for physical kind of accessory buildings. The the fuel island right now is a is a wood structure with two pumps in it, and you kind of access the pumps. Uh, you know, reach in, and grab the hose, and there's a diesel side and a, a gas side. But that they have underground storage tanks, probably getting pretty close to their permit age, and will need to be replaced. Probably in the next ten years or less. The idea would to have would be to have above ground uh, fuel tanks uh, in another location, which is safer and uh, less environmental concern. Right. Um, my my <laughs> next question is: you know, I understand that that the maintenance space would be heated, but the large vehicle uh, parking is that yes. un unheated space? No, it's heated space, but it's it's minimally heated, so it's not heated. To, uh, so 72 degrees or 68, it's, you know, 58 degrees. It's, if you want it warm enough so that you're in the wintertime, 
you're able to start vehicles easily. Um, so that that's the that's the purpose. It doesn't need to be heated to the same extent as habitable space, uh, like office space or vehicle maintenance or shops. Right. That, that, that is a very large space. I'm just I'm surprised that it's heated even to 58. I would have expected you know you know 40 something. But I understand. I understand. It's um, it's not yeah it's low it's low and there's insulation between that garage and other spaces inside so it's almost an exterior space but it, it would never get all freezing it's it's going to have a fire sprinkler system um, which means it's which requires a certain temperature right probably fifty degrees or something. yes I understand yeah. um, uh, th my my next question is what, what's the state of the septic on the site um, and is that would that be replaced as part of this project. Um, most, most likely I, I, I'm actually not entirely clear. I, I don't, I, 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 the septic system is, is, would, would have to be replaced. Well, yes. It probably dates to the, the building, I would guess, but, um, unless it was replaced more recently, um, I, I don't recall it being replaced, but that it, it may have predated what I was paying attention. Um, and then, um, the, the last thing, have you thought about, uh, transition during the time that the the building is being constructed. How would you do that? It, it would be difficult. I mean, we'd have to we'd have to phase that as much as possible. I think we could start construction um, on vehicle storage, and then I think we'd have to come up with a temporary arrangement for admin. I keep admin in the existing building as long as possible, um, and then transition to trailers or. Um, I think that's typically what we do with site trailers. Um, in this instance, it's it's a very it's a very tough site. It's it's got topography, as I mentioned. There's there's not a lot of room in the building that exists now as central in the site, so it's, it's, it has to be worked around. But we have phased construction, um, and we've we've also built temporary facilities like um, like a fabric structure, or in some cases, we've also rented facilities to perform vehicle maintenance while the construction of the new facility is taking place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know that in the in the design it should various layouts for the building. Uh, it sounds like uh, one important consideration might be is what the transition plan is for that fi final layout. You know, like if you're proposing to build the uh, A phasing plan. Yeah, the, the vehicle parking first, and that can only go where the building is not um, now, right? Then you you you're, you might be locked into uh, just one alternative for the layout of the, the site. Anyway, I'm just uh, they're I'm, they're just, all I'm obviously not choosing. But, um, okay, thank you. I understand. Dean, thank you. Yeah, just a, a couple of follow-up comments about the inefficiency of the operation presently with the, uh, the excess number of vehicles that are in there. Um, you know, when I was working there and, and running a crew out of there in morning and afternoon, you know, there was probably a half hour of productive time lost both morning and afternoon just doing the Rubik's Cube move of trying to fit all the equipment in there. Finally, you know, a lot of it we just had to give up and leave parked outside, and then it creates all kinds of problems, especially during the winter. It also, frankly, had in the past created some security issues. When we were running uh, mosquito control programs out of there, we had folks who were coming in and cutting the lines on the uh, mosquito fogger as a form of protest and, and ended up creating huge hazardous waste spills uh, for their activism. The other point as far as reusing the buildings, you know, and the, you know, is there some cheaper way that we can save these things or, you know, I'll point out that right now, Acton Barksville Regional School District is in the process of demolishing one and soon a second elementary school in town, um, both of which are actually newer than this building. And that was done for the good reason that those buildings had ex exceeded the expected life span, and the state, with the funding situation, felt that it was more advantageous to build new than to try to rehab. 
So I think to a certain extent, we're in the same situation here. Uh, they just reached the end of their life and it's time for them to go and it's time for, to build something new. And yes, it's a lot of money, but we're going to have to spend it. Are there any other comments? Um, you know, from watching it over the years, um, and this is where I agree with you, let's, you know, do it once and do it right. And we have a, a long history of the dark side of, you know, New England frugality. Um, you know, how, you know, can we get away with an undersized building and then quickly realize it's not going to be good enough and then we um, struggle and jump through hoops, you know, to make that building work. We've continually, you know, done that, you know, with, you know, with school projects, trying to save money and, and then you pay, you, get, you pay the price for it pretty quickly. So do it once and do it right. So anything else? So, um, uh, John, we have on for town meeting um, one of our capital articles. Of, is it a, 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 a full-fledged study or a, a, a design plan? Is that it? Yeah, so in, in the capital plan, we've, we've requested a million dollars to advance the next phase of design. Uh, of that million, uh, 200 is supposed to come from the transfer station enterprise. And uh, Corey, I believe we're borrowing um, in both cases, the 800 and the 200, is that correct? I believe that that's correct, yes. So, that, so that's the proposal, and of course that was brought forward, you know, three months ago before this feasibility study was completed, but we anticipated, and based on the board's prior relation of this project, we anticipated that it would be necessary to move this forward. Uh, at this upcoming town meeting. So whether a million is enough to do a full design, uh, I don't, I'm not sure that it is, but it's certainly enough to advance the design, to refine it, and potentially find ways to do it more cost-effectively, and to further find exactly what we would need and want to do out there. Hey, so um, Corey and um, Weston and Samson, thank you very much for your presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carcass. Um, so, item nine would be discussion of the Action Center traffic improvement project. Director York is back up. Uh, this is a project that uh, we've been working on, and, and Corey's made a presentation to this board a few times in the last few years, or I guess five years. Um, and Corey, uh, we have it on the town meeting warrant uh, to do the construction of this improvement to this traffic circulation. And we uh, have tonight an update on the design uh, for any comments and questions from the board. And Corey, could you please walk us through uh, where we are with the project? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I can share my screen, but I just had a, a few quick slides. Um, as, as John had mentioned, we have the Acton Center design. So we've been work going through the process as far as doing a, um, a, an initial sort of traffic study to look at concepts, come up with preferred design. Uh, we would get to that. Um, we're in the process now of doing our uh, design plan. So we've, we've implemented that. Um, we've gone through the 25% design plan, held a public forum and discussed that um, with the public and we talked with HTC, got input. Um, we're currently going through um, sort of the, the next step to get to 75 design where they're really uh, fine tuning details related to um, really making it fit, grading issues, resolving that. So it's, that, that's kind of like the really big piece, uh, very similar to what you see with the Kelly's cool and how it kind of follows that process. So. Um, we're, we're well into that process now. Um, our hope is that we'll be, um, we'll be implementing that, um, having that 75% design plan by late summer. Um, so, um, I think I am. Okay, go to the next page. Yeah, if you, if you have that on. So, uh, this is just sort of a concept that we, that we've been, it was approved and we're working on the on the design now so 
it has sort of the one-way flow around the common. Um, we're doing sort of a lane reconfiguration across from Town Hall, so bringing that in more 90. Um, we met, met with the APC and talked about moving the horse trough. That's essentially where that lane out. Um, we're looking at complete streets of adding bike lanes and um, improved pedestrian crosswalks. Um, it, it also is part of the process. Uh, see Woodbury Lane, it has a right turn only, so it reduces sort of the points of conflict with the Concord Road's coming out. Um, and the one-way traffic for Concord Road at Newtown Road, that helps to um, improve the safety conditions there. Is sometimes it's hard to tell with the angle of the cars right now to know if they're going left or straight across. So, um, so we're in that process going through right now. Um, like I said, we should have that in by late summer. Um, as part of this, we're also looking to um, look at sort of the town hall complex and uh, it's been sort of a goal of working on the parking and the sort of Woodbury Lane as you're coming into it, trying to improve um, safety within there. Um, fortunately, we have some, we've had some close calls in the parking lot with cars coming and going um, at higher rates of speed or just, and just volume. So uh, we're hoping to sort of pull that in as well and do some traffic calming and um, complete street improvements that would sort of make the whole area um, sort of a safer, more enjoyable experience, whether you're biking, walking, or um, driving your vehicle there, um, and just keep uh, keep everyone at a, a safer space. So it's, if you're going to the town hall, the library, or, or if going to the playground that we're sort of um, controlling how the flow is going through that and make it a little bit uh, safer for all. So our, our goal is to uh, have that all kind of merge into the Active Center project. Uh, so I think on the next slide, I just have some um, sort of a rough timeline. So we should have our 75% by late summer. Um, we're expecting to have final design by early fall. And um, we're in the process of working through sort of the town hall complex. So we should have concept plans by uh, late June uh, doing some outreach and hoping to incorporate that for a sort of a whole sort of uh, fleet street kind of traffic comic kind of package that would would be able to move forward and have it all kind of meld well with uh, with everything that's happening out there so uh, we just wanted to give you a quick update on all that and just let you know where that stands um, like as john said we have funding in town meeting um, it's, it, with the timing of this of the design plans being done that we'd be ready to start implementing um, the project itself. So, um, so we're hoping to look forward to keep this project moving forward and, and getting some of these um, amenities kind of implemented. So I can thank you and answer any questions you might have. Well, are there any questions or questions or comments from board members? Dean? Yeah, specifically, um, I'm interested in, in whether your plans are going to include any provision for pedestrian scale street lighting um, on the site, especially along the uh, sidewalk on Main Street in front of Town Hall. There's one existing street light, which is a sort of, it looks sort of out of place. It's a concrete post, it's not in great shape, it certainly does not fit with the rest of the decor. Uh, there's also lighting that's involved with the uh, horse trough, and of course there's also lighting involved around the Davis Monument, all of which probably need to be upgraded. Uh, you know, I hate to throw another cost factor into this thing at this point, but perhaps when you work out your design, you might find some way to at least get some conduit in the ground so that we can come back later on and put some, some decent lighting in there that will maybe match uh, what we proposed for Kelly's Corner or it might match what we've got behind Town Hall and the library right now just so it will look consistent. Sure, yeah, we've, we've, we've talked about it, like mentioned that concrete post for the street light at the crosswalk at the library. You know, we've looked at trying to replace that. And I know we've, we've talked about it a little bit as far as um, when we move these things. Um, 
we were going to reach out just um, picking people's brains. I know there's a lot of spigot over at the horse crop, so knowing where the actual service line goes, we want to talk to the water district and um, people that might be familiar with how that sort of connects in over there. Uh, those those are things that we're we're kind of looking into and trying to come up with a um, an approach uh, with the design. Thank you, John. Yeah. Corey, when you come on the right hand coming down onto Main Street, can you make a left and a right hand turn there, or will it just be a right turn? If so, if you're coming up Woodbury, the turn on the uh, Main Street? No, if you're coming down Concord Road toward Town Hall yeah. and you're bearing to the right, when you come to Main Street, can you turn both ways or only one way? I turn both ways there, so you'd be able to um, take a left and sort of go towards Newtown or take a right. So down. you you would be able to come down Concord Road, take a quick left, and then a right onto Woodbury Lane? Yes, yeah, yeah. At Newtown Road, Concord Road just would be just a one-way in. Right. Yeah. Well, I used to live on Woodbury Lane, and I remember when... Chris Farrell said you can't make that turn anymore, Joan, to get down Woodbury Lane. Yeah, they're difficult turns right now. Oh, it's yeah. A questions from Jim or David? Yeah, I know. Uh, David. Um, uh, hi, uh, Corey. The, the lane, the narrow lanes that are showed to the north of the north branch and to the south of the south branch, are those bike lanes or sidewalks? Um, on as you're going up Concord Road. Yeah, if, you, if you're uh, if we're talking the the, the uh, south of the South Branch, um, you know, uh, there there appears, you know, actually what's now in the uh, uh, up, upper left corner of the the screen where that the red arrow ends, is that a bike path that comes in there or is that a sidewalk that goes to the hashed crosswalk? Those are, uh, on Concord Road, those are both sidewalks that come out running along the side of Concord Road. Oh, okay, now, now, now that you're zooming in, and the bike lane is actually part of the street, as you would expect. Yeah, yeah the bike lanes are on Main Street, as you see, yeah. Okay. Got it, okay, yeah, very good, thank you. Uh, Jim? Um, sure. I'm, st I'm still very comfortable with this plan. I think it's a good improvement in lots of ways. Glad we're moving ahead with it. Um, one of the things I'm remembering is that with a much larger scope and, and additional state funding that went into Kelly's Corner, we had a lot of traffic studies that helped us to understand, uh, traffic modeling that helped us understand sort of the before and after. And I wonder if we have the equivalent of that for here, if we understand, uh, uh, I don't imagine we have the goal of, you know, increasing the speed of traffic through here. In fact, it's probably the opposite goal. But um, I'm wondering what we understand about, you know, backups or what, what will happen at our various rush hours. Yeah, we did the feasibility study. That was all part of it. We did... Um we did traffic counts and we did sort of an analysis looking at um, the flow through and uh, the various options that we were looking at, um, what would sort of still keep that, um, the, the flow going through and sort of improve the safety of these various intersections. So, um, that was something that we done, we did during the earlier phase in the feasibility. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want, and I, the only other comment would be just to echo uh, Dean's thoughts about um, pedestrian scale lighting. I know we have the challenge now of of cars going too fast there, and we do have the uh, you know the the um, that nice sign that that always flashes at me for some reason <laughs> when I get close to it, and then I go, oh right, I'm supposed to go slower here. Yeah. Uh, one minute, um, and um, pedestrian scale lighting might also help at night with um, you know signaling. To, signaling to cars that you know, hey, we're we're entering the kind of zone where you really need to go slow. Um, uh, uh, Corey, I uh, Han Chang had a question about will there still be parking in front of the library? Hmm. Yeah, currently what we have now, um, we have a bike lane through, but we would still 
minus, I believe we would still have um, sort of that trough area for a little bit there. I'll double check that, but I, I okay. think we would still have that. Any, uh, are there any questions from the public? There is, uh, there is one, yes. Tara, you should be able to speak. Uh, West Acton, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, please don't put my name into the Zoom. Thank you. Um, so a question coming in through, uh, the, some people are at the HTC meeting and uh, Facebook commenting. Um, so the horse trough, uh, there's some disagreement about what, some people don't like that being moved. Um, I agree with that. I generally like the plan. Uh, I think I see no new turning lanes. Is that correct? Um, as far as on Main Street, we don't have turning lanes, no, so it's one, one lane. No turning lanes, okay, thank you. And so the horse trough, I, it looks like it's, you're planning to move it to the middle of the common, sort of? Uh, when we met with HCP and we, we talked with them, um, the, the thought was is that it would be, it would move, um, I guess it would move sort of north in that little, in that area that's the road now it would have sort of its own area that it could be kind of showcased. Yeah, I would I would check with them again. There seemed to be some disagreement about whether that should be closer to the road because the flowers and all that stuff. Um, but in general, I'm supportive of this, and uh, but I don't like moving a historic object for accommodating cars. I don't like that. So um, I'd rather see that thing close to the street um, where horses would drink from it and where flowers can be seen. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Uh, Matt, are there any other comments from the public? Uh, there are no more hints. Okay, Corey, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, we have one re remaining item, the uh, community center concept. Let's That'll probably go on for a while. So um, if it's okay, let's do the consent items so we can clear those up. So um, consent item 11, approved meeting minutes, April 12. 26 and May 3, 2021. Uh, 12 approve executive session minutes April 5 and May 3, 2021. Uh, 13 approve letter of support for Great Road sidewalk installation from Main Street to Meyer Hill Road. Uh, 14 uh, committee appointments Leng Ya Zhao, Associate Member, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commission. 15 except Kelly's Corner right-of-way acquisition 1 Beverly Road, 16, except Kelly's Corner right-of-way acquisition 245 Main Street, um, 17, except gift recreation department for $1,500 from Insula Corporation to support the 2021 <clears throat> concert series and special events, um, 18, except gift recreation department for $7,500 from Patrick Gallagher for labor and materials donated for construction of stairs in the south building for the narrow support pavilion. 19, except gift uh, recreation department for $4,500 for Brian uh, Griffin for labor and materials for work completed in the south building at the narrow support pavilion. 20, accept gift for the Recreation Department for $50 from the Morrison family to be used for constructing a dog park in Acton. 21, one day alcoholic beverage license, League of Women Voters, June 1, 2020 at the Narrow, picnic, uh, Narrow Park Picnic Pavilion. 22, um, one day alcoholic beverage license, James Jackson, um, May 22, Narrow Park Picnic Pavilion. 23, one day alcoholic beverage license, Linda Jones, May 15th, Narrow Park Picnic Pavilion, conditional approval by chair on May 10th, 2021. So do I have a motion to approve um, uh, uh, consent items 11 through 23 inclusive? So moved. So moves. Is there a second? Second. Second, David. Um, if there's no further discussion, David, please call the roll. Uh, Mr. Snyder Grant? Aye. Ms. Gardner? Aye. Mr. Charter? Aye. Mr. Benson? Aye. And I also say aye. So it's unanimous. Okay, if no one 
needs a break, um, we can go right into the presentation of the uh, proposed community center concept. I believe uh, Chris Hardy, Kelly Stowe, um, and Roxy Rocker, if we could bring them on to the screen. Mr. Chair, I'm having some technical difficulties. Um, can you repeat those names? Um, it would be Christopher Hardy, Roxy Rocker you have, and Kelly Stowe. I think uh, Chris was going to open up. I believe I got everyone. Okay, I think that uh, Chris, uh, Chris was going to let Roxy and me just go ahead and take the wheel, if that's all right. That's fine. Sure. Uh, please uh, proceed. And may I share my screen? Please. Okay. Thank you for having us. Well, let me put this into a presentation view for you guys. I, you, I wasn't quite ready, even though I had like three hours to prepare. <laughs> Oh, just give me one moment. Okay, thank you. All right. So I'm Kelly Stowe. I live in Acton on Hayward Road. I've got two kids in the school district. Um, I've gotten involved with this community center team recently, and I'm excited to present to you our ideas today. I just want to preface this by saying that what we're presenting today is an, is an evolving concept that continues to be informed by citizen feedback. You may have seen an earlier version of this slide deck floating around on social media uh, in the past few weeks, and if you did, uh, you'll see tonight that we've made some revisions based on the many discussions we've had with other residents in the town. Um, we do hope that you'll listen to this presentation with an open mind and understand that in the overall spirit of a community center. We wish to have constructive discussions around this concept with the goal of finding a way to make a community center work for the town. Um, that said, we felt a sense of urgency to bring this concept to the town right away, uh, given our recent knowledge of Stop and Shop's imminent plans to sell the Kmart parcel to National Development, the assisted living developer, uh, if Stop and Shop determines by June 1st, two weeks from now, uh, that they won't be using the property for their own purposes. Uh, that is, unless the town shows interest in purchasing the property and directly influencing what ultimately goes on that lot right in the center of town. I would just also add the disclaimer, we are not an official appointed town committee. We had a question about that on social media and I wanted to be very transparent about that. We're simply a group of citizen volunteers who feel there is a need for a community center enacted. So getting into the nitty gritty of what we wanted to talk about, uh, many of you know a key priority of the Act in 2020 Comprehensive Community Plan is to transform Kelly's Corner into a distinctive pedestrian-oriented town center. The Kmart parcel is within the limits of the Kelly's Corner Improvement Initiative area. What we have presently, an empty commercial lot in the center of town, provides an opportunity to bring our growing town together. An opportunity to build a sustainable anchor point in the heart of Acton. Our vision is to provide a centralized, sustainable, inclusive, and functional community center to support the community, wellness, recreational, and social needs of Acton's growing and diverse population. This initiative will transform an eyesore of a property into a beautiful gathering place for all. And if we do it right, we can make Kelly's Corner a distinctive pedestrian oriented place that people want to go to, that draws more business and businesses into the town. This is especially true if we give it a flavor that highlights the unique cultural makeup of our growing town, a cultural hub that offers programs and community supports, a town center that encourages nighttime business and doesn't shut down at sundown, a place for all in the heart of Acton. With that, I'm going to hand it over to my teammate, Roxy Rocker, if you'd like to just do a quick introduction and take it over. Not a problem. 
Thank you for having me. My name is Roxy Rocker. I'm actually a Foxborough resident. I have worked in Acton in the past for four and a half years at the Historic Exchange Hall as a licensed massage therapist. I'm also a very active member of the Middlesex Chamber of Commerce, and, um, and I have been an Acton resident in the past. I have an interest in this because my background is from civic engagement and human services. I have switched to wellness recently, and I'm a business owner. I'm here because I very much believe in community, and it's a place to grow, gather, and give back. And we can take this building that has given Acton very much opportunities for commercial and bring it into a place where all people can join. Solar panels can help with electricity costs and feed the grid and can help the environment and issues around climate change, including recreational opportunities and functional meeting spaces, making places accessible for all people of all abilities. This parcel can also possibly provide, as one concept of an idea, street side restaurants and retails very similar to the West Acton Village, where our members of our community that are so diversified and are growing can actually meet at local taverns and shops. And there could even be the concept of having residential units building even more revenue for the community. A community center could increase business and economic development for our wonderful town of Acton. Next slide. So I will just speak briefly to this slide. We did some research on the surrounding towns around Acton. And as you can see on this slide, Acton is highlighted in yellow closer to the top. Acton is the largest local town with no community center. So some of our competitors, one, one surrounding town that I included that is not directly bordering Acton is Lexington, but I included it because I think it's a relevant kind of competing town. Um, but you see here that the next the next largest town that has no community center is Littleton, with less than half as many residents as Acton. And I think that's compelling. That tells an interesting story. And I think we have some research to do on this as a town. Uh, back to you, Roxy. Absolutely. So as this is another concept of one of the things of a community center could lay out, there could be outside seating for events and community conversations, a health and wellness room so people can get treatments and and um, have have wellness resources at their at their service. Uh, co-working spaces, flex meeting spaces, and there could be wide variety of different opportunities in this layout. So this is just a concept, but there could be many options to create an opportunity for growth, diverse conversations, and community building. Next slide. Thanks, Roxy. So we understand that the cost of this project is a major concern for many in the town. That's what we're hearing. And trust me, I'm not interested in higher taxes either. Um, there are some ways to make this parcel a social and economic hub for the town. So let's talk about how it might work. We are confident that the town can purchase the parcel for roughly 6.3 million. Um, I'm hearing an echo. I don't know if Roxy, you could mute while I'm talking. Yep. Thank you. Okay, hopefully that will help. So we're confident that the town can purchase this, this parcel for roughly 6.3 million based on our market research. We think it would be most beneficial to pursue a public private partnership approach with this property. So we're proposing that the town split the six acre parcel and sell off the frontage on Main Street for restaurant or retail development. While we know it might be an uphill battle, we could also consider some form of housing on the backside across from what will be the new entrance to the school and maybe some behind the Verizon building. Thinking roughly 30 units plus or minus total, which is considerably less than the 120 plus units that have been promoted by developers in the past. Um, that many units will not overwhelm the site, nor fundamentally have an impact on the schools, and arguably could make the site better. Looking forward to actually using the property, we could begin using the building for community purposes almost immediately. 
after some light rehab to ensure everything is up to code and 100% safe for citizen use. Ultimately, construction and, operation, uh, construction and operations and maintenance costs will be dependent upon the degree to, agreed upon design. If the, if the town supports this use of the property, we would certainly obtain citizen feedback as we work to achieve consensus on the design and programmatic uses. Uh, back to you, Roxy. So when we're really investing in our community, we can have some great economic benefits. Creating workforce solutions, making collaborations with the one stops and bringing things closer to us, having opportunities to working with the Chamber of Commerce and SBA and having opportunities to build more businesses. It can support local businesses by allowing them to use their space for event planning and other opportunities. And at times, these can also create opportunities to increase property values when being used for recreation and um, events. Next slide. The social benefits, which after this year that we have had and gone through, I think this is a really important conversation because if we can have a multi-generational cross-cultural gathering place in Arizona, I used to participate in an interfaith Sikh event where we had interesting conversations and diverse conversations that mattered, but we were fed a cross-cultural meal. We can gather and have places that can help with health, wellness, and mental health, and a place for all people to exercise and make it an inclusive place for all to join and possibly even have opportunities that gives low cost or free access to indoor recreation programs. Next slide. And here's where it makes my heart sing and what have done for many years in the state of Arizona, partnership opportunities and collaboration. Anytime you get to have collaboration, there's a time for growth and opportunity in your community with rec departments, nonprofit organizations, cultural groups, faith groups, and all different clubs, which could make for even a greater town and a greater opportunity for us to get to know our neighbors and get to know one another. So with that, we're just gonna cut to the chase and tell you what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, and Roxy, sorry, I'm getting that echo again, so if you don't mind. Thank you. So what we're asking is, specifically we're asking that the town manager and the select board or the vice chair, I guess it would be, have a conversation with Stop and Shop and inform them that there is some interest in the parcel within the town. That gives the town time to consider the feasibility of such an investment, um, do some research, make sure we do our due diligence and consider what kind of public-private partnerships or uh, uh, breaking up of the property could work um, and you know I think that's some something that we need to do we don't want to make just a shotgun decision uh, there is a sense of urgency around this parcel so we hope this presentation holds as much merit in your consideration as the ne national development presentation that was delivered in March um, the second thing that we'd like to ask is for the incoming select board to prioritize the establishment of a community center at their prior prioritization meeting in July and that will help focus town leadership on thoroughly investigating this issue. So with that, um, are there any questions or comments from the board? Okay, so what, what, uh, so Kelly and Roxy, what you're asking us to do is, is that you want us to go to town meeting and get a sense of town meeting, whether they would support the idea of, of, of the manager and uh, the select board vice chair um, um, going to stop and shop and saying the town uh, has evident has um, has interest in buying the Kmart parcel. Is that the idea, or um, just for us to take action tonight? Well, uh, I guess that would depend on what the necessary protocols were. 
Um, my impression was that it wasn't necessary to take that discussion to town meeting, but if that's something that needs okay. to happen, we would request that. Okay, but okay, so we could limit it then to what will would this board be willing to do it, you know, based on an action it takes tonight? Yes, I think that's what we were intending. Okay, 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 that's good. Okay, so um, let's have uh, 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 comments from board members uh, go around the horn in the usual way. Start with Jim. Um, sure. Um, Kelly and Roxy, thanks for the presentation. I think you've outlined the challenges exactly right, which is that there's there's definitely a compelling interest in a community center and bringing people together. And at the same time, there is there is so much work to be done to understand, um, you know, what do we actually need? What is it feasible? Um, you know, the, the, the sort of the preliminary work that would have to happen. And at the same time, we have this looming uh, June 1st date when Stop and Shop has to decide whether to close the deal with national development or hold on to the parcel for a while. So I think your proposed solution of, of having the, the town manager and the vice chair or whoever would be appropriate to go to Stop and Shop and say, hey, we haven't made any decisions yet, but you should know that there is this conversation about buying the land for a community center. Um, they may or may not, that may or may not change their mind, um, but at least it would be a way of saying, you know, this conversation has started and we thought you should know about it. Um, I think that seems entirely reasonable. Um, the, uh, you know, having a feasibility and a needs assessment uh, next year uh, also seems like a fine, you know, thing that we can discuss as a new board. Um, and even to that, in that sense, even if the this particular parcel disappears, I, I believe there is still a need to understand what, what could be done in, in a community center somewhere? Um, you know, what what are the facilities we already have? What's the advantages of bringing them together into a central location? I think these are all good questions to be asking. Um, so whether or not the uh, Kmart parcel ends up the way we want, I think it's still a good move for us to be, uh, you know, addressing this, uh, this important. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, John. Uh, I, I think these two women have done a fine job outlining this, but earlier in the meeting, didn't we have a multi-million dollar um, at the DPW site? Yeah, about $30 million, $32 million, yeah. Yeah, and how much can we afford to do? May I respond? Please. Yes. Okay, that's something, Joan, I appreciate your comments, and that's something we are trying to iron out, and it's something that we need to discuss with the town to determine what is feasible. Um, the reason why we think the Kmart lot would be a wise investment is because it is right there in the center of town. So if the town owns that, the town has the opportunity to define it and give Acton some ca additional character beyond what we already have, maybe to ultimately positively influence the town economically and socially. So I understand there would be an investment. It wouldn't be um, $30 million to start, I can tell you that. I mean, you can start off small and phase. Um, but I think there are more conversations that need to be had, and that's why we are asking the next select board to prioritize this issue and to think about it critically and to consider some of those things. Because I know the board understands the nuances of this a little bit more than some of us volunteer citizens who haven't uh, had a chance to engage in some of those conversations. So, thank you. Um, David? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, uh, there are um, uh, a number of questions here, I mean, a huge number of questions, but I think this is worth investigating and, and uh, looking into to try to come up with some of the answers to the, the questions. I mean, as, as Jim alluded to, what kind of facilities do we need in uh, uh, would we want a community, community center? I know that there's um, differences of opinion there because people have expressed differences of opinion uh, to, uh, to, to me and how much each type of um, facility w would be used. Um, you know, a lot of our recreation in town has been self-funded, um, uh, self, self at least the operational cost 
what, what kind of facilities that could we put in here make that self-funding model what kind wouldn't and you know if we don't how, how would we fund them and how would the whole community center be run um, basically I think um, oh and also you know people have said that it should be uh, combined with a future senior center and people other people have said no we got it we need to come have some consensus around around these things um, that's the kind of thing that we would do in a, in a feasibility study and and no I don't know whether the timing will work for the stop and shop parcel or, or not but I think it's 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 worth um, you know thinking about and answering um, uh, these questions uh, you know to determine what we you know what, what what would make sense and how we might go about accomplishing it. Thank you. Dean. Dean. Thank you. Um, you know, it, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, you know, we're talking $6.3 million. The property right now generates about $175,000 a year in property taxes. It's 120, Dean. 120. Um, presumably, if the town owns the parcel, there's there's an opportunity cost of $120,000 a year that's lost. Depending upon what a private developer might do there, presumably there'd probably be more taxes generated. So our opportunity cost loss would be even greater. Um, I I expect that probably there's not been an architect in there looking at the building to see if it's at all feasible to do what's being suggested here. I think the building is probably approaching 50 years in age and was built under obviously a totally different building code for a different purpose. So I suspect we might be in the same situation that we encountered it an hour or so ago talking about the DPW building is that it's cheaper to demolish it. Um, that was a decision or that's the guidance we're getting on the DPW building, and that's the guidance that the school district got for two elementary schools that are of about the same age. I believe the Fairbanks Community Center in Sudbury is being rebuilt as we speak, and I believe uh, ex expands, uh, I believe it's being expanded and renovated, and I think that they're spending 20 to $25 million on that. So I think you know, if we're talking about what is the likely cost, I think we're probably in the same vicinity that uh, my colleague Jim Snydergrant choked at when we were talking about public works building. Um, you know, we're probably talking thirty million dollars. These, and this is just idle speculation on my part. Uh, we haven't had a chance to think about it and look at it. So. There's, there's lots of lots of questions. Um, I think it's I think there's good opportunities to start the conversation with the new board, and I certainly support that. To do some more investigation on you know what what do we need as a community center, and I'm not saying it should be one building necessarily. I think we've got a lot of public space that's that's available has been shut down for the last year and a half, but for instance our human services building, it's about twenty two thousand square feet that's used thirty eight hours a week. So there might be some opportunities to get started with some additional programs there. Uh, there's space available in the Memorial Library. Uh, we're talking about doing a a renovation expansion the ace of parliament house and providing space there so i think there's lots of opportunities for space and i suggest to you that that might be a good way to test out some of your assumptions and start to build a constituency that's the model we had to do with the senior center we had a very small senior center donated by a developer and it took quite a while to get out of that and into a decent space but in the meantime, we developed the program, we developed a constituency, and we knew where we could move ahead. So this is just very, very ambitious. I would certainly not be opposed to myself and the town manager can have a conversation with the folks at Soccer Shop 
and let them know that this conversation and this presentation took place tonight. I'm not going to say at this point that I'm going to endorse it, but certainly we would let them know what the uh, you know what the tenor of the town is on this. That there is a group that's interested in it, and I'd be certainly interested to see what kind of public feedback we get from the rest of the uh, the citizenry that are going to end up having to pay for potentially a thirty million dollar building, and then uh, we haven't even discussed the maintenance and operational costs. Mm -hmm. May you. I may I respond? Sure, sure, Kelly. Thank you. Um, Dean, I appreciate your comments. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we know that people are concerned about the cost. And so we're thinking about ways to offset that by potentially splitting the parcel um, and having some sort of a membership scheme. And there are other towns across the country who have successful community center membership schemes and are able to sustain them without being uh, an undue burden on taxpayers. We just need to think about that. One thing I would say is I think you're making some assumptions in your estimates for the costs here. And for the DPW presentation, they had the benefit of having a feasibility study to really look at that and see what the costs would be. And I would just ask the same um, for something like this. If we're going to do it, I would ask that we do some sort of a feasibility study or needs assessment to help inform this. And as citizen volunteers, I do not, as a citizen volunteer, I do not have the resources to do that justice. You know, we need a professional to look at that. So that's something that we would ask the next select board to look into. But I do appreciate your willingness to chat with the Stop and Shop about this. And I think that's really what we were hoping for tonight. We just wanted some willingness. Okay, so if um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the sense is, um, we would have to move on this with the first step to advance it would be to have representatives John and I would suggest Dean um, approach um, uh, Stop and Shop, their, their brokers. I think it's it's something, re, uh, their, their, their brokers who are handling the sale and express the interest that the town, um, you know, would, is, you know, is, or the a select board is considering um, of purchasing the parcel because that's really the first step. That's the, the linchpin in all of this. And uh, it's taking the property away from potential third party um, developers, uh, you know, to give us time to, uh, you know, develop a plan and, and, and see if it works. And you have to keep in mind with, with Stop and Shop, their uh, lease with Sears um, runs out um, at the beginning of November. So th they're not going to be getting any more rent to, to carry the parcel. They have a $120,000 tax bill to, to us, uh, plus whatever ongoing, you know, cost there would be to maintain um, the store. So, um, you know, they're in a position or one way or another, they, you know, I guess in all likelihood want to, you know, want to sell it. So I guess a logical first step for the outgoing board um, if we can all get behind it, and it sounds like we 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 could, um, is to instruct a team to go over and uh, speak with them and express an interest in what sort of timetable they would be looking for for us to, uh, you know, you know, make a decision. So um, with that, um, you know, um, would there, uh, you know, be a uh, would can we move to um, send John and Dean um, to um, approach Stop and Shop and express an interest on the town's part in, you know, in buying the parcel. What do you think? Um, I would be happy to make that motion. Yeah, okay. Is there a second? You're muted. I, I, I will second that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, John. I just wanted to mention that there are people who like have their hands up. I'm not calling. Okay. Well, well, we just we have to have something before the house, and uh, and then we could have discussion on the motion. So it would somebody you're seconded? Yes. Okay. So let's take um, a citizen discussion. You know, on the motion to approach, stop and shop, uh, expressing the town's interest in buying the Kmart parcel. Okay. First up is going to be Ellen Feinsand. Ellen, you should be able to speak. 
Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Ellen. Okay. Hi. Thanks, everybody. I think our guests have made a very dramatic and compelling presentation. But I would like to speak. My name is Ellen Feinsand. I have lived in Acton since approximately 1981. That would be December of 1981. And I have seen many changes taking place in Acton. I live a stone's throw from the Kmart parcel. So I am a very interested participant in this topic. However, I find that the idea of spending other people's money is a really nice thought if everybody agrees that everybody has an unlimited amount of money to pay for taxes. To say in this presentation that certain things would be done and it would be free, everybody could come and it would be free. No, it wouldn't be free because the taxes would go up in order to pay for whatever the amount is, whether it's the 6.3 million or something up to and potentially including 20 or 30 million to get something like this going. It took approximately 10 years to move from a very small senior center area to something that is very desirable. What I didn't hear in any of this is what the alternatives are for whatever particular and specific activities we would want to absolutely put in this community center without any attempt at saying we, your group, or whoever ends up really fleshing this out, what are the actual concrete activities that we in Acton don't already enjoy enough space to do? For example, lots of outdoor space, lots of recreational activities, lots of places inside our very expensive schools and facilities that we are already paying to support that would accommodate many, many activities, athletic activities, community activities, swimming, all the things that we already have facilities to use. The Human Services and Senior Center building has lots of space for people of every age to come and congregate. You mentioned, one of you in your excellent presentation mentioned health and wellness. Well, I don't know if everyone on the phone knows this, but Acton has a nursing service and public health department that provides services for people of every age in the community, including tests for students in the schools, including concussion testing, preparation for sports testing, making sure people can be ready and safe. People all ages have been helped by our public health and nursing service, and that is located right in an existing building. 30 seconds or more. Okay. I make the point that I think this is way premature. I think the idea of making a decision between now and June 1st and even hinting at a commitment to the potential seller is very premature. And I think we should explore how community activities could be done elsewhere. And then when we see that there are too many to be done elsewhere, then consider purchasing or leasing space in other areas. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Next up, we're going to hear from Nancy Cochran. Nancy, you should be able to speak. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that you can hear me. Uh, this is, uh, I've seen this presentation twice. It is intriguing. Um, and you have certainly updated this from the last presentation. But um, I really am reluctant to have 
something as significant, costly, and nebulous as to what will actually happen inside this center happen at this time that feels like we're under the gun. We have to do it now, before June 1st. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel respectful of all the residents who have waited years to have a space that meets the needs, their needs, their current needs, and are open. Those folks are open to their to the rest of the community using their spaces as well. I concur with Ellen and say that you need perhaps to investigate this concept. What will you provide inside of your community uh, space? And then, then let the rest of Kelly's Corner project go forward and find another site for a community center. There are spaces in town as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. All right. Next up, we'll hear from, I believe this is Tara, but it is a call-in user. If you could let us know who you are, where you're from. Hi, this is Tara. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, I started doing a study a long time ago about the available spaces and found that they're all booked or they have requirements that are impossible to meet. You know, you have to be a certain religion or you have to have, be connected in with these other groups, and it's impossible to do. Um, I also looked at the rental cost for a building like that. It was like three times the cost. So I did some numbers. I ran some numbers, and I'm wondering if these, if you all decide to go forward and go talk to Stop and Shop, ask them if they'll take five million bucks, sell off a million dollars up the front, um, which I think we can actually even get more maybe, and um, the nonprofit can lease it for 100 years and pay for the difference. And it'll be no cost to the taxpayer. That's what I would like to propose. Um, just as an idea, to see what they think about a $5 million offer, a $4 million offer, you know, um, for just that building in that section. Or, you know, anyway, just an idea. I support the idea. I think a community center is like investing in love. Um, yes, we can invest in trash, and I think that the building needs to get fixed over there. Um, but I also think that we got to be focused on getting consultants that, that specialize in rehab instead of consultants that you know have a vested interest in these new buildings. Um, it's over and over again. It's the same people that will benefit, you know, from these new facilities as opposed to getting some folks to understand rehab. I, I know that they're around somewhere, um, and I believe that we can do this. I ran some numbers, so I don't know how much more time I have, but um, just as a small concert facility, that's a, there's a big gap um, in the National Touring Acts for 300-seat venue. That you can book this up and pay for this easy. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Tara. Next up, we'll hear from Jeff Bergart. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you should be able to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jeff Bergart, Alcott Street, Macron. I live in town 40 years, and um, I'm a finance guy, and I have two points to make. One is uh, growing up all my life, I, I kept being uh, confronted with need versus want. And um, I think it's important for us to decide what we need versus what we want, um, especially since when we have a cow that produces tax revenue, and you can't take too much out of the cow before the cow dies. And um, that's an important thing that uh, the presentation is wonderful. I think we want it. I'm not sure that we need it. Previous speakers talked about alternatives. And yeah, maybe it is tough to get a basketball court, but um, that's the way you have to make trade-offs. But the second thing I want to talk about, which people may not have thought about, is in town, we can't tax based on how much money you can afford in your income stream. We can't tax based on how wealthy you are. We tax based on the real estate value. So one of the points made by the presentation was, a real estate value is going to go up. Well, 
that I know doesn't directly tie to taxes, but taxes are my biggest income item in my budget. Uh, I don't want to fix income. I'm retired. And um, I think that that's important because as tax as values go up um, and taxes go up, there's a huge segment of this town that um, doesn't get as much value from uh, living in town. They don't have kids necessarily in schools, and we know schools represent three quarters of the tax bill. And they're going to be squeezed out. And we have so much focus on diversity in the town, but we're going to squeeze out the middle people. There's a group of well-meaning people that want more and more affordable housing. Well, that's fine. If those condos are valued under market, then they will pay less in taxes, and the tax rate will go up for all the people in the middle who perhaps can't afford it. So I just want to make sure that when we talk about diversity, we're also talking about people who lived a long time in town, maybe a, a little bit older, and, um, you know, yes, they would benefit from a community center, but I think they'd be hit quite, quite high uh, in terms of the cost. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Are there further citizen comments, Matt? Hi, this is uh, Lisa Nipple. I got a prompt to unmute, so I'm going to go ahead and speak. Um, I live in South Acton, been in town 20 years. Um, I'm very supportive of this project. I know this group has um, spent a lot of time gathering a lot of feedback and doing a lot of research. Um, and I'm encouraged that the board is considering um, authorizing the town manager and the vice chair to approach uh, Stop and Shop um, to have a conversation. Um, I'm really excited about the possibility of a public-private partnership and um, being creative and imaginative about uh, a way to fund this project in a way that does not put a burden on the taxpayers and dividing the parcel um, so that there can be some, some businesses on the main street side. Um, I keep hearing talk about the, the age and the lifespan of buildings and it seems like municipal buildings um, have a much shorter lifespan than all of the homes in town, which is interesting to me because homes are, are built of wood and <laughs> municipal buildings are usually built of concrete and brick. So I would think that they would last a lot longer. Um, my home is 67 years um, and we certainly weren't considering knocking it down and rebuilding new 15 years ago when it was 50 years old. Um, I believe that the twin school, um, the triple school, I should say, was um, the decision to, to build new rather than rehab had more to do with the funding available, all of the, the grant leverage that happened and not because it wasn't possible to rehab it. Um, I followed this Kelly's Corner Community Center group on Facebook, and I've seen a lot of their ideas and a lot of, of photos that they've shared. One happened to be an old Kmart building that was turned into, I believe it was a high school. It was rehabbed and renovated, and it was quite beautiful. Um, they showed some pictures inside and out. So I think that it is possible to reuse that building and um, save some money there. And... Um, in terms of the cost of all of these available spaces or availability of these spaces that folks are saying can be used um, for meetings or or events or a swimming pool. Um, I'm not, I haven't found in the 20 years that I've lived in town that that's the case. Most, most of the available rentals are too high for, for our budget. Um, a lot of times the meeting rooms are not available. Um, a lot of times you need to have a membership in a, in a church or you need to pay a custodian fee or to have staff on site. Um, I imagine that that's the case with the senior center 
and the large rooms that they have that they say are available for the public. Oh, so you are out of time. Thanks, Matt. No worries. And I do want to apologize. My um, audio dropped off. I'm not sure why. Um, Chris, you are up next. You are on the panel already. Yes, hi, everybody. I am one of the team members of this volunteer effort to um, propose this vision. And this this type of building, this, this, the Kmart, has been, has been built other places in, into community centers. It's it's a, it's just gonna it's gonna there was a question by I forget who it was asked what kind of things can we do in a community center that we're proposing and one of the floor plans showed that and you know there's 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 rooms in there that are available that people go outside the question is why do people in Acton that have to have events go outside of Acton to Littleton to Westford to Concord to to wherever to have their events. It's because we they don't have a community center or somewhere to do it because all the school rooms or other availability available venues are all booked up and they're too expensive. They're not accessible. They're not available. I mean, people were complaining about the pool. Why don't we have a pool? Well, the pool is not accessible. I'm not 100% sure, but it's it's not it's not open twenty you know twelve hours a day for people to use. A community center would be. We would also the price that you're you're talking about twenty thirty million dollars. That's not what we are talking about here. We're talking about purchasing for let's say six million. We would sell the frontage to a retail developer who would then in turn build say two buildings like we had pictured in our renderings which would then generate some more tax revenue. So we wouldn't be losing the whole, however much, say 250 to 300, that we would just create an entire property for a community center. Now, we're gonna offset the cost of the whole base of the, of the, of the yearly cost to the taxpayer by rent, having memberships, by renting out rooms. We've crunched numbers, but we're not a, we, we don't wanna share that because it's an estimate. What, we, what I'd like to ask, and I think is being voted on, is that the town asked and talked to stop, stop and Shop and slow things down so we can then broach this in a slower manner as a goal that has been a goal since the 2020 study. That's It's in the books that we are in need of a community center such as this. 30 seconds remaining. And... We're asking that at the goals meeting that we we have that feasibility study, and we see at what cost analysis in that bid. So we would have a feasibility study, we have a cost analysis, we would survey the people what they want in there, and that's what we're asking for. We're not saying purchase it now. We're tell, we're going to ask. We're looking to purchase it, but we need to do some more study and homework. But we have a lot of support. And I understand there's support that's been talked about here that. Is not Christopher, you are out of time. The, the, the endeavor, the vision, but that's all I got to say. Thank you, Chris. Mr. Chair, that is all we have for hands raised. Okay. Are there further, thank you, Matt. Are there further comments from board members? Again. Sean, may I just speak one more moment? Sure, sure, Roxy. Thank you. I just want to say that I think that, you know, some of the the comments that were made by this are also really important too. But I also would like to say that I think that we're in the beginning stages of something that's being created. And we've had a year. And, you know, and I feel like also too, that programs and projects and things that happen in a community center happen from the intergenerational level to the youth level to the adult level to every aspect of a town when you have community centers things are being brought in and morphing all the time because one minute you could have an incubator and the next minute you could be having a big powwow and celebrations of different cultures going on in the evening so all that i'm saying is that 
when we're only seeing one thing from a lens, I think we need to see it from a bigger lens. And yes, we talked somewhat about diversity, but I think if we expand it in the concept of what community really means, and even take the word calm and bring it to unity, the whole reason why something like this is such an important piece for community is it can bring people more unified and unity brings things together. And that's my only last comment I want to make because I believe also in heart work and human service work that makes change. And um, I feel like even if this parcel at Kmart can't happen, that the fact of the matter of a community somewhere happening in Acton or Acton in Boxborough nice would be a real big concept for these sounds. So that's my final point and thank you for that. Thank you, Kelly, do you have anything further to say? No, sir. Um, I just welcome anyone who has concerns about this concept to please reach out to the Kelly's Corner Community Center group and we'd be happy to talk to you about it more and think uh, strategically about how we could accomplish something like this without burdening any specific demographics in the town. So uh, further comments from board Chair. members? Um, sure, thanks, Jim. Jim. Uh, so uh, I, I'm thinking about the wording of the motion that's on the table, and I, I think we need to adjust it. Um, I think the wording that you that you might have suggested is something about how the telling stop and shop that the town is interested in buying the parcel, and I think that's not correct. Um, we're what we want stop and shop to know is that we are discussing the possibility of buying the parcel, which is true. We are discussing this possibility. We can't make a promise that um, you know that at the end of a you know, a process of, of, dis of, of discovery and feasibility that will actually decide to, to buy this. But I think the point here is that if, 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 if Dean and John communicate this, you know, this, the essence of this discussion to stop and shop, then they can make their own choices about whether they're, you know, whether they're, they're willing and able to enter a conversation with us that would take us well beyond, well beyond, June 1st, before we got to a decision. Um, yeah. Yeah, June 1st, uh, to, to, I think, to, to Ellen's comment and Nancy's comment, um, it, it's it's not really um, a drop today. That's their own uh, timetable for deciding whether they want to develop and redevelop the property. Right. Um, yeah. And then they would turn to national development. Um, what they would, I think, want from us is a sincere, you know, interest, um, whether, you know, discussing the possibility or we are, you know, we're going to pursue the possibility of buying it. Um, so it's not a conversation that goes off into space because they're going to want to move the property at some, you know, at some point they can put off national development for a couple of months. It would probably be in easier sale to us because there's no permitting that's required, you know, uh, give us your check and here's your deed uh, versus national development, which uh, would have a couple of month period to, to do their due diligence and see if they could get the necessary uh, special permit that they would require from the next board. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I mean, I, I don't care how you want to phrase the motion. Um, but, you know, they're going to want to see, you know, a sincere interest that is not something that goes off into space. But you really, to do something like this, you really have to buy and control the parcel to have the conversation we're talking about. So other comments from members? Dean has his hand up. The Dean. Yeah, I, you know, my offer was phrase the uh, stop and shop folks of this conversation in this meeting um, I think you know it's it's really premature for us to even talk about gee we want to buy it or gee we're talking about buying it I think I think my David, we're up next David 
my only thought was, if, you know, if the board dodge affirmatively, and I don't think we particularly need a motion, is the manager and I can just talk to them and say, well, there's, there's this discussion going on in the background that you guys aren't aware of. But I certainly would not intend to make any further commitments than that. I think that's really premature and, uh, you know, it, it's really preempting work and decisions that are going to have to be made by town meeting and certainly the next select board. Okay, so Dean, what would you suggest in, in terms of uh, sending you and John off with what message to stop well, and shop? I, I think I've got a pretty good sense of, uh, of things from, from consolidating what I heard from Joan, what I heard from you, I heard from Jim particularly, um, and you know, he had some good cautionary words a minute ago, and, and I'll certainly take those along. And frankly, I'd like to hear what David has to say, and you know, just let, uh, let John and I have that conversation. Uh, David? Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm uh, uh, thinking more along the lines of what uh, Jim and Dean are, are saying. Uh, I certainly don't want to give the impression that we're, you know, on track to buy the property. And I would never vote for buying the property first and then figuring out what to do with it. Um, uh, I just, th that's, that's an unworkable situation in my mind. So uh, what, what I would like to know, you know, in, when you, you talk to Stop and Shop is, first of all, understand their time frames, tell them that we have this conversation going on in town. Um, and um, in the meantime, if it's um, a, a priority at the goal setting meeting for the next board and we do a, a feasibility study and maybe those things align, um, that, that, that something could happen. But, you know, I, I, uh, a lot of things need to align there. As you know, in my, when I spoke the first time, there are a ton of questions here. Um, there are many more questions than we have answers right now. And, you know, we need time to answer those questions before we buy the property. Thank you. Okay, so, um, um, uh, just without without uh, necessarily taking a vote, um, why don't we do a thumbs up that um, uh, Dean and John go off to Atlantic Retail. Those are the, that's the brokers for Stop and Shop. To inform them that the town is, you know, uh, the, the select board is discussing, you know, the possibility with a town group of, uh, of buying the Kmart parcel and what would be the time frame that's involved. Mr. Chair, uh, if I may, three yeah. citizens have asked to speak. Okay. In the interest of hearing everyone, please, uh, let's do. Let's hear from them. First up, we have Colin user one. Colin user, please identify yourself. It's just Tara and Aruna from Nepal. She, her son wrote in in favor of this and she was wanted to make sure that you guys got the email um, because young people really love this idea apparently. They want something to come back to and something to stay for. And uh, so I love where this is going and thank you. And I'm gonna work on a revenue neutral proposal with these folks, thanks, bye. Uh, next speaker of math is. Yep, next up we have Jennifer. Jennifer, you should be able to speak. She's muted. Jennifer, you may have a mute button on your screen you need to uh, activate. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So I am just, I think that um, some of you may recall, I had called in a couple months ago in support of a community center. So I 100% back this whole presentation that you've seen tonight. Um, what I would say is that I think a lot of people on this meeting tonight, unfortunately, it is not representative of the town. Um, 
because not one, I am so sorry, that is my son yelling. Um, there's not anyone I've heard tonight really representative uh, that has kids in the school system. And I think that the Kmart parcel being the Kelly, Kelly's Corner Community Center area really could be beneficial. And that is one of the reasons why, number one, I believe in a community center, but number two, I believe in it being in this particular area near the schools. So I guess along with the feasibility study, if it could ever happen, my request would be to try to somehow engage this community in a more reaching out scenario to try to be representative of the community because this call and quite often town meeting is not. So that is what my statement for tonight is. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Last up, we have cultural Nepal. You should be able to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, as an immigrant mother coming from Nepal and living in Acton almost 30 years, I have seen few changes, not as much as you have. But one thing I see that it definitely is evolving and the inclusive, inclusive, um, um, uh, inclusiveness is uh, very important to me. And I think this having this community center will be some place where I can bring out uh, what I have to offer to the community as well as learn from uh, other members of the community. So um, me and my son um, really appreciate this and actually um, talking with his friend, um, the young, um, they are all excited and I probably already, you already know, uh, one of my friend's son has um, happily sent email to you with the support of the concept and um, having that young generation and old generation getting involved um, would be very, very good for our community, I believe. Thank you so much. And I have um, actually I've interviewed, um, uh, uh, um, I have uh, produced an interview in Acton TV. So if you get a chance, um, I highly recommend you to listen to that program. And um, that's my spirit for the community. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. So, um, so let's, if there's no further comments from, from the public and board members, um, let's just by a, by a board members thumbs up that we're gonna ask um, John and Dean to reach out to Atlantic Retail to inform them that uh, we're discussing the possibility of buying the parcel and um, what is their time frame for um, selling the parcel. Um, and hopefully you guys can get in to uh, speak with them this week and be able to report back to us next Monday night. Does that make sense? Thumbs up? Dean? Dean, are you on board? Yeah, I think, you know, one, once again, you've talked about the town's interested in buying the, pro the parcel. I, I don't think that's what we've been talking about. I think John and I are going to talk to them and explain that there's this undercurrent going on in town and there's interest in it. But I think it's really reaching as a member of the select board to go to them and say the town's interested in buying it. So I, I think if you, I think I'm reading. How would you, how would you want the instruction rephrased? I think I've got the point. I don't think you need to take a vote on it. I think John and I can handle it from here. Okay. Uh, uh, John Benson, just as a matter of formality, I think you have to withdraw your motion and I have to withdraw my second. Okay. Uh, okay. I move to withdraw my earlier motion. And, and I'll withdraw my second. Okay. So it's off the table. Okay. So Dean, 
and John, you would be clear on what the board is asking you to do. John, you're good? Yeah. All right. Joan, you're with it? I'm with Dean. Okay, so you're we're all together then. Okay. No, we're not all together. Well, okay, we're as together as we're going to get, um, but we're good. We're, we're taking a step, a positive step. You know, as you, as you know, we know from, you know, our experience over the years, um, you know, go back, you know, 20 years ago and the three big non-school projects we did, the Memorial Library renovation in addition, the purchase and construction of Narrow Park, um, the public safety building, they were not initially warmly embraced and two of those projects took two, two shots to get approval, um, but they did demonstrate a lot of foresight in the end, and um, they're very valued assets. You know, let's keep a, a real open mind on this and wise open. So, okay, so we're good, and let's hear back. We'll put it on the agenda for next week, and if you people can report back to us, that's great. All right, so um, that would conclude our agenda for the evening. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So, so we'll, Jim, a second, second Joan. Um, David, if you call the roll, please. Sure. Uh, Mr. Snyder Grant? Aye. And Ms. Gardner? Aye. Mr. Charter? Aye. Mr. Benson? Aye. And I say aye. We're adjourned. Okay. Good meeting. See you all next week. Bye. Bye.